Sunday, May 23rd, 2021. This is the second half of the lectures on faith number one fireside. So I'm just going to put that at the beginning of this video so that people know what that is. Um, we had a very good suggestion from an individual that said that we need to go back through the firesides and actually change the uh, the name of them from simply the uh, date and the uh, fire, right? That's all you're going to see on the thumbnail uh, and the title to actually uh, what that particular fireside happened to be about. That's a great idea. So we're going to go back and, and do that. We're swamped with uh, some of the things that we're in the process of doing right now. And so, but that's a great idea. And we're now in the process of doing that. So if, if you're looking for a specific date for a fireside that it might be changed soon so um you might not see that front and center it might it might just say um fireside colon the 10 tribes fireside colon um lecture on faith um um number one part two so just so that you're aware that is what uh, uh is going to be start happening with the firesides so make it a little bit easier for people to recognize after the fact so if they're looking at one and go oh um that's one that i'd be interested in seeing versus just random dates so that was a that was a great suggestion we're going to be going through and and doing that if you go to the 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 family website which uh for the fireside if you just click on the link in the description of what you're seeing in the video so if you click on a fireside um we'll provide a link down below that takes you directly to the section on our website dealing with the firesides if you you're watching the Joseph Smith return paper and you click on the uh, description box and you click on the link in the description box for that video, Joseph Smith to return. It'll take you directly to the, the part of our website where you can download that paper totally for free. So it, it hopefully it really shouldn't be that confusing. Um, so hopefully that'll make it easier for you to do that. But if you go to the family website for the, the firesides, the, uh, we, we have there, if you scroll down, we have the date, but more importantly, we have the names of the guests as well as um, the, the Word document and PDF document that you can download that will that tells you what was talked about in the fireside and, uh, or that was that is what was talked about in the fireside and then a brief description of what the fireside was about. And so we've already been providing that information on the family website, but if you're on YouTube and you're looking at the video, all you're getting is just the date. So um, hopefully that makes sense. So if you are looking for a specific topic in the firesides, don't go through the YouTube video list of the firesides, head on over to the family website and click on the fireside section or uh, like I've said, click on any fireside, click on the link in the in the description. It'll take you to the page where all the firesides are. And then just scroll down until you find uh, the topic that you're you're looking for. And so that that uh, is the way to do that now. And we've been doing that from the beginning. And so you, you'll be able to see um, who was there, who was the guest, the date, and also a, a brief synopsis of what we were talking about. So. Hopefully that, uh, hopefully that will make sense. Today, the fireside is just me. So it is just me. Um, and next week, we also, so far, do not have any guests signed up. The week after that, we do have, um, for the first, ha uh, first part of Lecture on Faith number two, we have Marlene from Building Zion. She has uh, uh, volunteered for that. So um, if you are interested in, in joining any of these firesides, as always, um, you, you understand that how we do this, that, that, that uh, uh, we, we try to keep it grounded on scripture and doctrine and, and, uh, you know, how the, the, the process is that we go through the, uh, the, you know, asking a question or going over a topic and then, you know, discussing it. So if you're, if you want to, or you're feeling prompted that you say, Hey, I want to show up to one of these, uh, or I want to send in some information or I want to participate in, in these firesides, um, please uh, send me an email or, um, talk about it on the Discord channel or um, what's another way you can get in contact with me? Um, the Q&A on the family website. Um, any one of those means and, and say, uh, hey, I'd like to show up for this. So um, I'd like to show up for this fireside for, for these reasons. So, And we'd really appreciate that. We love hearing your voices. 
Um, I don't mind doing a little bit of talking, so I, I don't mind doing this one. I don't mind doing this one by myself. But uh, I, I do enjoy listening to to you uh, talk as well. So um, the the mic is always open. So I will start with a prayer, and then I will uh, explain what we're doing today, and um, and then I will just head right into it um, because it'll be just me talking. Um, it will be a little bit different, but uh, hopefully we'll still follow the same uh, pattern. So, Father in heaven, we are grateful for this day. We're grateful for every Sabbath day that we get to experience and be blessed with in this mortal probation. We're thankful for the opportunity, the chance to to prove our love to thee and uh, our remembrance of thy son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice that he made for us on our behalf. And we're grateful for that opportunity in the sacrament. Father, we're grateful for being able to take that on, on Sundays and be able to show thee that we remember thy son and what he has done for us. That Father, we pray that we can be one in him as he is one in thee. We pray, Father, tonight for thy spirit to attend us so that we can further be edified by thy spirit and to learn things that will help us pass through these difficult times that we are living in and be found worthy of the blessings that are shortly to be uh, bestowed upon the, the righteous in Zion. Father, we pray for the technology that it will uh, work and that it will uh, function properly so that we can um, have an um, an edifying experience together. And we love thee, Father, and we're grateful for all that thou has done for us and for uh, the blessings that thou has bestowed upon this group and its members and its uh, loved ones as we have fasted and prayed uh, for each other. And we pray and start this discussion in Jesus name. Amen. So what we're going to be going over today is the second half of lecture on faith number two. Now this, this is a smaller half than the first half. Um, but it is equally important, equally awesome. The lectures on faith are, are fantastic. There's been some questions or you could say feedback on the lectures on faith uh, that I've received after doing the first one. Um, after we finish lecture on faith one at the end of this fireside, I will go over some of those common questions, common, maybe you could even say concerns or, um, maybe even, um, semantics. Some people don't like that. I'm calling them Joseph Smith's lectures on faith. I will address that, um, at the end of this. Um, and so, but, uh, un until I get to that, just be aware that I will refer to him as Joseph Smith's lectures on faith and, uh. Uh, we will be going over the second half of that today. I will throw Joseph Smith's lectures on faith can be found for free on a multitude, uh, multiple sites online, um, including on our family website. So if you go to the family website, you can go into the resource section and we will have links to the lectures on faith where you can get them for free, as well as the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. Um, we've also had a number of people because uh, not unable to find previous years of the LDS student manuals for the Doctrine of Governance of Book of Mormon. And so we've also put links up on our family website for the PDF for uh, those sources as well. So there's just this kind of common resource area that we kind of have now that people can't find this stuff online. We're providing those PDFs for you for free as well, the, the links that you can go and find those things. Um, but that's what we're going to go over today, uh, the, the second half of the first one. The lectures on faith are set up in a very interesting way. Um, I, I, um, uh, I love lectures on faith and I learn so much about how to learn with the lectures on faith. The way that they're written is they're written in doctrinal, uh, a, a form where he'll just, though there's the lecture or the teaching, um, or the doctrine Okay, now that, that'll come up important at the end of this when I'm just when I'm explaining something with that. So uh, it is the doctrine. Then what Joseph, uh, what they, what we have in the lecture on faith is we have a series of questions provided at the end. Then we have in the questions a a a, a numerical value given that that is given for where the answer is. So he'll he'll ask a question like, um, how much wood could woodchuck chuck, right? And then parenthesis, C paragraph 35, end parenthesis. Okay, so, and, and then what he'll do is he'll below that provide his answer, provide the answer. 
And so it's 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 fascinating. It's not in such a way that you would if you would if you're reading it, you'd read the lecture, then you'd read the question, and you would either be able to answer it right away, or you'd go, hmm, I don't know the answer to that. You'd look at what he provided, what the, they provided as the answer. So they'd say paragraph, you know, two. You then go back above, read paragraph two, and then go, oh, I know, okay, yeah, that's right. This is the answer. Then you'd go back down below, continue reading, and then you would read um, um, the answer that is provided. And then you would be able to compare the work. You'd be able to compare and go, okay, what did I, did I get it right? Did I do this process right? And this process of learning is a, a process that we should all get much, much better at because this is a process of confirming the spirit of the Lord, confirming intelligence. Um, far too often we have people um, in the church that will pray, they will claim to receive revelation, and then they will just go off and act on it. And and what you will find with like every story, um, that is not how the revelation happens. There is a, a process of con confirmation and back and forth and, and going back to tying it to the scriptures, right? That there's that scripture that I, or that quote from President Joseph Neely Smith that I, that I quote ad nauseum about how, um, if we don't read the scriptures, we won't even qualify for the Holy Ghost. But then even when the Holy Ghost comes, we learn and preach my gospel that when we get those inspirations, we need to then double check them against the word of God. That, that's what it says in, in the um, preach my gospel, recognizing the spirit section. So even after we read the scriptures, we pray, we get the revelation, then we go back and we confirm it with the word of God, Con confirm that it doesn't conflict with what we know. So when Nephi was told to kill Laban, so Nephi obviously was familiar with the scriptures. He read the scriptures. He did his best to do that. That the whole point of getting the brass plates was so that he could continue to do that. So he 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 understands the importance of scripture desperately. That's why they're there. That that that's why he's trying to get. Um, that's why he's trying to get those scriptures. But then when he's told, so the Holy Ghost says, "Kill Laban." He doesn't just grab a sword and just immediately start whacking. There is a process of of. Nephi going, okay, I know that you're telling me to do this, but I, I, I need to confirm this. Can I need to confirm this against the word of God and what I know. And when he starts saying it is better that one man should perish than a nation should dwindle in unbelief, we kind of like to pretend like this is the first time um, Nephi's heard this. That's not accurate. What the spirit is doing there is bringing Old Testament scriptures to Nephi's memory which were in the brass plates. It is better that one man should perish than a nation should dwindle in unbelief. This is That was not an old, or that wasn't a brand new doctrine. That was something that Nephi was familiar with. And then Nephi said, oh, I get it, okay? I, I've, I've read the scriptures, I've followed the Holy Ghost, and now I've confirmed what I've just received with the Holy Ghost and what I understand once again back with the scriptures, and now I'm gonna move forward with doing it. And, and this process is what is taught, I believe, pretty explicitly in how the lectures on faith were actually organized. And so uh, it's a fantastic read, but it's, it's also a fantastic way to break apart your scripture study and learn how to um, learn how to learn. So um, the first question or the, the first questions that we're going to go over today are questions seven and eight. And, and some of these are very, very, very connected. So uh, there's actually only three sections that we're going over today. Three um, groups of questions that all, you know, very closely related. This one is questions uh, seven and eight. That says, is not faith the principle of action in spiritual things as well as in temporal? Question eight, how do you prove it? So they're, they're two different questions, but they're very closely connected. So we're going to attack them both together here. Then it tells you to go up and see um, paragraphs or sections 12 through 14. So let's go up to sections 12 through 14 and read those again. Okay. And as faith is the moving cause of all action and temporal concerns, so it is in spiritual for the savior has said, and that truly that he that believe it believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's Mark 16, 16. As we receive by faith, all temporal blessings that we do receive. So we in like manner, receive by faith all spiritual blessings that we do receive. 
But faith is not only the principle of action, but of power also in all intelligent beings, whether in heaven or on earth. Thus says the author of the epistle to the Hebrew in chapter 11, uh, verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the world and framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen believe and is baptized shall be saved. So there's a there, there's another golden scripture. Um, Joseph Smith, uh, translation of Romans chapter 4, 16. Therefore, ye are justified of faith and works, meaning we become justified because of faith and works through grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to them only who are of the law, but to them also who are of the faith of Abraham, right? So this is the literal seed of Abraham versus the adoption, who is the father of us all, okay? That's what the, the answer is that's provided there. So then I will provide um, uh, for the lectures on faith, what I, what I will try to do when I'm adding commentary is I will just add what I think are the most important things that people should take from what we just read. Now, I believe the lectures do a very good job of speaking for themselves in a lot of regards. They just, they're very uh, plain, plain. But I also understand that bullet points or breakdown summaries um, can be and are very effective ways to, to learn and to teach um, doctrine that maybe we're having a little bit of a hard time uh, uh, wrapping our, our mind around. So what are some of the important things that we need to, to, to kind of really understand and grasp with what is being taught here? The first thing is, is that we need to understand that there are temporal things and then there are spiritual things, but there are not temporal commandments and spiritual commandments. In 2 Nephi, Lehi teaches us that there are things to act and things to be acted upon. Now, spirit matter, as well as temporal matter, can both be acted upon, right? You cannot create or destroy matter. And our spirit bodies are created with spirit matter, i.e. things spiritual. The way we act act upon things of a temporal nature is the same way we act upon things of a spiritual nature. Now, this does not mean, however, that a commandment from the Lord to act in a temporal nature, i.e. when the Lord, uh, an example being when the Lord told Moses to put his physical staff in the physical water, that does not mean when the Lord told, gives us those commandments, that they are somehow temporal commandments, for there are no temporal commandments. They're all spiritual. And we read about that in Doctrine and Covenants chapter 29, verses 29 through 35. I won't be going over that here, but if, you, if that is a foreign concept to you, I would, I would recommend going and reading those scriptures. So the first thing we need to understand is that that, that there are temporal things, there are spiritual things, but that doesn't apply to commandments. Com there, are, there aren't temporal commandments and spiritual commandments. All commandments are spiritual, right? But they, we, they may be um, us acting on spiritual things or on spiritual matter, and they may be things with us acting on temporal things or temporal matter, right? Such as grabbing a, a, a staff, a wooden staff, and sticking it in some water. Very temporal things, but when the Lord told Moses to do it, it was not a temporal commandment. It was a spiritual commandment with a spiritual um, uh, consequence and blessing attached to um, us obeying it or disobeying it. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. The second thing is um, the way we treat the acting on things temporally is exactly the way we should treat the acting on things spiritual. A man would not expect, and we go over this, I believe, in the first lecture on faith, that a man would not expect, or at the very least he shouldn't expect, to receive fair wages or compensation for a job that he never showed up for. Likewise, a man should not expect from the Lord things, blessings of a spiritual nature without doing the work or the requirements. The uh, An example of that which he provides here is you need to be baptized or you'll be damned, right? So you, you can't 
you can't expect the blessings beyond baptism if you're not going to be baptized. You have to first be baptized or else your, your progress will be damned. We obtain temporal blessings, right? So you need to show up to your job or you're not going to get a paycheck, right? You'll be damned. Your, your flow of money will be damned, right? We obtain temporal blessings by obedience to true knowledge regarding temporal things, right? We plant a seed, we water it. These are all these are all aspects of true knowledge regarding temporal things. That obedience based on true knowledge is faith. We obtain spiritual blessings by obedience to true knowledge regarding spiritual things. That obedience based on true knowledge is likewise faith. Okay, so that's uh, that's the, the second thing that we should uh, wrap our head around uh, with this uh, breakdown of what we're learning here in Lecture on Faith. The third thing is, is that, that we learn is that faith is power. And we're going to get into that a little bit in the, next, in the next point, but but we need to break this down a little bit further before we get into the next point. And I will just say that this uh, breaking down of this point, breaking down of what I'm going to do here, is a perfect example of something that that we do a lot in the church that personally frustrates me. So um, I, I hope that maybe as we go through this, members that are listening uh, out there might um, do more of this on their own, right? So and you'll understand as we go through this what what I'm talking about. So the first what do we have first thing that we have to do to understand what is being said here faith is power what does that mean the first thing we have to do in order to understand what is being said here is we have to define what the word power means we've just done a really good job or they have done a really good job in the lecture on faith of explaining to us what faith is right uh, it, it, you know th th they've done a really good job of that so we should have a uh, at least a, a, a small inkling of an understanding of what that word means. But when they say faith is power, what does that word mean? What does the word power mean when said here? So let's go to the 1828 Webster's Dictionary and let's learn some definitions of what uh, uh, power meant in the 1820s and 30s, okay? Some, some uh, explanations or some potential definitions. Faculty of the mind as manifested by a particular mode of operation as the power of thinking, comparing and judging the reasoning powers. Another definition, ability, natural or moral. Isn't that interesting? So they're saying it's either a natural thing or a spiritual thing. We say a man has the power of doing good. His property gives him the power of relieving the distressed, or he has the power to persuade others to do good, or it is not in his power to pay his debts. The moral power of man is also his power of judging or discerning immoral subjects. Another definition, in mechanics, that which produces motion or force. That's a really important one. So something that produces motion or force, or which may be applied to produce it thus. Thus, the inclined plane is called a mechanical power as it produces motion. Now, uh, an inclined plane is just a ramp. Um, although this, is, uh, this in reality depends on gravity. The wheel and axle and the lever are mechanical powers as they may be applied to produce force. Produce force. These powers are also called forces, and they are of two kinds. Moving power and sustaining power. That quality, in, another definition, that quality in any natural body which produces a change or makes an impression on another body as the power of medicine, the power of heat, the power of sound, etc. The last definition that I will provide here, influence, that which may move the mind as the power of arguments or of persuasion. 
Okay. So how is faith a principle of power based off of those definitions? That's the word that we were given. given. If one had a belief that he would get paid if he worked, he believed that, that would give him power, ability, to get up and do the work. Okay? This is why, as Elder Bednar taught, quote, taking action is the exercise of faith. True faith is focused in and on the Lord Jesus Christ and always leads to action, end quote. Uh, you can actually find that in Exercise Faith in Christ. It's actually a video. Okay? So, it is the thing that produces the motion or the force in the individual. It produces the, the, um, the force. And by the way, many other prophets and apostles have taught the exact same thing with regarding faith, that it always leads to action. And why? So why does it always do this? Because faith is a principle of power. It gives power. Power to the individual, to the mind, to keep going, to do. Or, as the Bible Dictionary for Grace explains, it says, quote, It is likewise through the grace of the Lord that individuals through faith in the atonement of Jesus Christ and repentance of their sins receive strength and assistance to do good works that they otherwise would not be able to maintain if left to their own means. This grace is an enabling power that allows men and women to lay hold on eternal life and ex exaltation after they have expended their own best efforts, end quote. Okay, so where does my frustration come in? So what, what am I frustrated about? Okay, if you or me, we were to take this 1828 definition of the word power. So we had all those definitions. We're starting to understand what it, what, what message, what, what's the understanding that it's trying to convey. And then we bring it into the 21st century. What would be the word that you might use instead of power well the bible dictionary here actually gives us the answer enable or enabling when you look up the definition of in the 21st century of the word enable or enabling it says quote to make able give power means competence or ability to something so maybe some already know where I'm going with this. It, it, it frustrates me as a, as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints when uh, an apostle or a prophet uh, quotes something. They're quoting something. And then the church explodes with merchandise and memes with that quote-unquote new quote as though it was something new or groundbreaking or earth-shattering. It's a new earth-shattering way of viewing something. When Elder Bednar penned his The Enabling Power of the Atonement, he was doing nothing more than modernizing a single word taught in the lectures on faith. That was it. It was nothing new. It was nothing earth-shattering. And if he was worried that members, in his words, so this is what he said when he when he, he penned that that uh, talk, the enabling power of the atonement, and he, he penned this before he became an apostle. So that's another thing people need to realize. So he penned this um, as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He wasn't even an apostle at the time, and he said, quote, members just don't get it, end quote. He, they, he said they just don't get the, 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 the atonement. Well, if he really believed that, at that time, he should have suggested to them reading and studying the lectures on faith. Because the lectures on faith, lecture number one, teaches us 
that faith is a principle of power, meaning faith is enabling. Faith enables us to do things. Without faith, there is no reason to act, right? There is no, there, there's no power in it. If I don't believe I'm going to get paid money to go to the job, why would I go? There, there, there's, there's no, there, there is no power behind it. There is no motivation. There is no moving influence behind it. Okay? So, in summary, when you think of faith and power, so when, you, when you're reading the lectures on faith and you go, oh, faith and power, um, try not to think of it in the 21st century. Like, faith is power like, you know, Superman, right? Faith is power like um, oppression or like aggression. You know, power has a, a lot different of connotation than it was used back then. Think instead of enabling or enabling power. Okay, and that's by the way, that's all Elder uh, Elder Bednar uh, did there. Is is he? Um, once again, it's also found in the Bible Dictionary. So enabling power there is found in the, the Bible Dictionary. So think of faith as enabling or an enabling power, and um, and then a lot of this other stuff will hopefully become a lot easier for you to understand um, as we as we break it down. So that is the end of those questions. So, um, yeah, somebody just said here that uh, 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 Reba said God can increase our capacity. Yeah, that's exactly how this ties into it. That's exactly right. Um, um, Elder Maxwell said that uh, God does not begin by asking our uh, ability, only our availability. And when we prove our dependability, he will increase our capability. So, yes, yeah, so that is that is exactly what the, this lecture on faith is is tying into. So that's exactly right. It's... Uh, it, but but we and it's what enables us to grow and to get better, right? And so, um, and so what Elder Bednar was talking about was that too many people view um, the atonement as the end goal. They view it as Doctrine and Covenants forty five, Jesus Christ standing there in front of the Father and just getting us back into His presence. But the atonement is is an enabling power, and, and what and what do we what do we learn in Lecture of Faith one? All faith needs to be grounded in the Savior, right? And the Savior's pentacle is what? The, the, the apex of understanding the Savior is the atonement. So it's one and the same. So when we understand faith and when we understand the Savior, we understand the atonement and that how it connects to this journey of life, it doesn't just apply to when we're standing in front of the, the our father in heaven and Jesus is providing that last great mediation it applies every single day of our life every single day of our life when when we are going about doing the best that we can it is what gives us the motivation to move forward and take the next step and take the next step and take the next step and the more that we understand that faith is a principle of power right the more that we understand that faith is a principle of power, the less, the more we'll be able to do in our life, the more enabling that we will experience in our own life every single day. Not just waiting for some grand thing, oh, I will be perfected in the next life. Perfection is a process. Perfection is a process as we learn. We, we learn grace upon grace and we get that step by step by step as we uh, as we approach uh, the the throne using you in another way of saying it is the enabling power of the savior the the uh, the principle of faith as power the enabling power of the atonement they're synonymous so um that is something that we can hopefully wrap our head around and and realize that this is why faith is so important right? Why understanding it is so important. Because if we have a true understanding of faith, we have a true understanding of, of the power principle of faith, we'll, under, we'll be able to take more things into our own hands with the Savior, right? This ties directly into uh, Ether chapter 12, I believe it's 27, that scripture mastery, um, uh, that uh, the Lord will show us his weaknesses, yeah, or the, I, the Lord, give unto men the weaknesses that they may be humble. 
but my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. That is faith as a principle of power. That is the enabling power of the Savior, okay? It's not just some um, um, theory. It's not just some nice thought or pretty words. It's something that can cause us that when we truly understand it, it can cause us to stop sitting on our backsides and all of a sudden go, wow, yes, I need to stand up and I, I can do this. I can get up and I can do more. It, it, it can help us uh, overcome depression maybe. Day, you know, I wouldn't say maybe, it, not entirely, but maybe a day. Like Let's focus on a day. Focus on that faith and it'll get us to stand up and it'll get us to do something that day. And then maybe another day, and then maybe another day, as we as we focus on the Savior and the principle of faith is power, as we focus on the enabling power of the atonement, until eventually that weakness becomes a strength in us. Not not a million years from now, not when we're standing before the judgment bar of the uh, of of our Father in heaven, but now in this life, right now in this life, the Savior has the power to do that now in this life so um and like i said there might be times it's a weakness so there might be times that that depression or those weaknesses can come back but as we that that's just a process of it but eventually eventually these weaknesses can be made strengths of that i testify so that's a question, the first sets of questions. Are there any questions before I go on to the next one? Wow, okay, I just scroll up here to um, the Ricks, and I don't know which one it is that uh, it, the, the, the name tag is... Um, Sister Ricks, but uh, Brother Rick, this might be Brother Ricks here, um, does this quote from President Oaks that I would just like to read. This is really good. The scriptures will help us resolve all of our personal questions because by reading them, we invite and qualify ourselves for the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, which will guide us unto all, uh, guide us into all truth. Amen. That that that's just another way of saying it, right? That's another way of saying it. That's perfect. When we study, we qualify ourselves for the Holy Ghost. When we don't, we don't qualify ourselves for the Holy Ghost. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. Wow. Um, somebody asked up here at the very, very top, says, Are you still planning on MP3s? I I've uh we've been in the process of doing that. So uh, if you go on to the family website. Um, you should see about 10 to 10 to 30 percent of all of our uh, all of our videos mp3 just the audio files are now available on the website that's something that we're just slowly um, eating away over time so uh, yeah you will see beside the the picture you will see a, a download for the file in word so that's the written document you will see the a download for the document in PDF. Once again, that's the uh, the written document. And then you will see a, a little audio um, symbol. And uh, that is the download for just the audio file. So if you just wanted to listen to things. So we've been doing that slowly over time and just tacking away at it, doing, you know, two, three, or four, let's say a week. And, uh, and so that's been growing. So you should see more and more of those up there. Um, if there's one that you want, <laughs> you know, right away, you know, maybe send me an email and say, hey, do this one next and, and we can do that next. But uh, we've been doing that slowly over time. The ones for um, YouTube on the Firesides are a little more difficult because I have to download them first. But um, but we've been doing those as well slowly over time. So um, somebody here asks, still looking for the evidence that thousands of state. Oh, my goodness. Close, as you stated, in April. I'm not finding the big backs up that statement. I keep forgetting to, to look that up for you. I didn't think it was that big a deal. Um that is, um, I, what's his name? Rob, what's his name? Rob from, um, the Heartland model guy. Um, that was a fireside that he did. It was on the slide. It would literally take me three minutes to look up and I keep forgetting to do it. 
Um, I was saying that that is what was on his slide, and his slide had a reference on it, and it was it was uh, seemed pretty darn solid. So I can send you that link. Hopefully, I can remember that. Wait one sec. Hey, Ashley. Squealing at Ashley, as you can hear. Maybe she can uh, look this up real quick. Okay, you remember Rob from the Heartland model? The Is his name Rob? Rod, duh. Did, oh, gosh. Sorry, Rod. Um, he doesn't listen. Don't worry. Remember that fireside that I listened to that uh, was sent to me by, um, was, it, was it Green Tree? Can you go find that, that fireside link in the, or if Green Tree's in here, if Green Tree shows up, <laughs> resend that uh, fireside with a uh, rod because in that fireside he had that slide about remember thousands of stakes or uh, the stakes being shut down in, in uh, south of the border and it, it had that reference okay there you go sean boy i apologize there i stopped the fireside for that one i apologize i keep forgetting to do that that was not m me that said that i was quoting rod but um you know i uh i i Rod is a, does a pretty good job of of um, uh, referencing stuff as well, so you, we can quickly go on that that fireside and look at that uh, reference for you there. So I apologize for uh, I'm not writing you off. I com completely keep forgetting that. So Rod Meldrum, yeah, some people are saying that down below now. Okay, good. So Rod Meldrum, it was his fireside um, that he 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 brought up that slide and said that I was quoting him. And so, and I went back and I actually checked the slide and saw the reference. So, uh, you can definitely, he had, and it, it was part of a larger series. So what he was going over was how you, the numbers of baptisms, uh, that the, the church has seen, um, uh, per year. And he was showing the last 10 years and, and so it was, it was part of a larger, uh, segment, right? So he wasn't just talking about people south of the border, but, uh, that was mentioned there. So. Anyway, any other questions? So we definitely got that one out of the way now, and I can, if Ashley is out there on the phone and she gets that fireside, she can uh, post that for us. So um, that was a Rod Meldrum fireside. That fireside was over an hour long as well. So are you referencing this last Easter one? It was his his the last one that I got, the, the last one that I think he did. I think it was like, I think he even labeled it part two. So I think it might have been part two. And he, it was a fireside, you know, where it looked like it was in somebody's home and he was standing up in front of what looked to be like a projector or something, a projection screen. Um, uh, that's all I can remember. So they were sitting in a home, a very clean white home, <laughs> and there was a projector screen up there and then he had a little uh, clicker pointer and um, and that's what he was going over. So it was, it was during that fireside that he had a slide that was four hours long. Okay, yeah. It's in there, okay. So uh, um, that's that's where you're gonna find that inform that information. So um, anyway, we're gonna go on to the next question here, and hopefully Ashley can um, post post that in there, or uh, Derek can can lead people to where that that is located. So somebody's really interested in that. That's very interesting. Um, and I thought I so anyway. I would recommend, and I would recommend sitting down and watching that entire four hour long thing. I think that he brings up some very interesting points. Um, I believe that uh, his source for last day, macro last day timelines is um, not very stable. But other than that, I think that, uh, um, I think that uh, a lot of that information in there was very useful information that is definitely worth uh, uh, a, a watch. See, it, it was over four hours. I don't... I don't ever watch people's videos at one time speed. I always watch them at two times speed. And so I remember it being about a, a two hour experience. So that's probably right. So I, I was watching it at two times speed. But um, I can I can click on that video and I can go find that. Um, looking up LDS says 1.5. There you go. So yeah, so just I just watch it a little bit faster. So um, anyway. So yeah, title of the video is Come Follow Me Easter. Where are we in the Book of Mormon, Rod Meldrum? I think that's the video. I think that's the video. And he's the one that has those slides where he goes over. It wasn't just about stakes closing down south of the border. He was also talking about all of the numbers regarding missionary work within the last two decades or so. 
And it's not uncommon knowledge. So uh, I, I'm not trying to throw Rod uh, under the bus for, for, te for teaching this. I've been saying this for over two decades, too. The numbers worldwide for missionary work is not looking good. And so, um, so I, and I will stand by that, but, um, because I can, because the church puts out the numbers. So they're very good at putting out those numbers that we can, uh, we can see. So, um, uh, the individual, now I'm at the very bottom here, the individual that was asking about that, please go watch, um, where are we in the book of Mormon, Rod Meldrum, and you will have your answer. Watch it at two times speed and you'll have it. So, um, question the second set of questions that we're going to be going over in the lectures on faith. Question number nine, I better get a drink. Is faith anything else besides the principle of action? What is it? How do you prove it? So that's questions nine, 10, and 11. They're very similar. Um, they're all kind of connected. And so we're going to throw all of these together. And then it says, so where do you go to get the answer to this? So let's go up and read it. He's, it's sections 15 through sections 23. Now, there's a, it's a lot here, but we're going to read through it. By this, we understand that the principle of power which existed in the bosom of God by which the worlds were framed was faith. And that it is by reason of this principle of power existing in the deity that all created things exist. So that all things in heaven, on earth, or under the earth exist by reason of faith as it existed in him. Had it not been for the principle of faith, the worlds would never have been framed. Neither would man have been formed of the dust. It is the principle by which Jehovah works and through which he exercises power over all temporal as well as eternal things. Take this principle or attribute, for it is an attribute, from the deity, and he would cease to exist. Who cannot see that if God framed the worlds by faith, that it is by faith that he exercises power over them, and that faith is the principle of power, and that if the principle of power, it must be so in man as well as in the deity. This is the testimony of all the sacred writers and the lesson which they have been endeavoring to teach to man. The Savior says in Matthew chapter 17, verses 19 through 20, in explaining the reasons why the disciples could not cast out the devil, that it was not because of, that it was because of their unbelief. Quote, for verily I say unto you, said he, if ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you end quote moroni while abridging and compiling the record of his fathers has given us the following account of faith as the principle of power he says in ether 12 13 and it was the faith of alma and amulek which caused the walls of the prison to be rent as recorded in Alma chapter 14, verses 23 through 29. It was the father of Nephi and Lehi which caused a change to be wrought upon the hearts of the Lamanites when they were immersed with the Holy Spirit and with fire, as seen in Helaman chapter 5, verses 37 through 50. And that it was by faith that the mountain Zaran was removed when the brother of Jared spake in the name of the Lord. See also either chapter 12, verse 30. In addition to this, we are told in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 35, that Gideon, Barak, Samson, um, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, through faith, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, and the women received their dead, raised to life again, etc. Also Joshua, in the sight of all Israel, bade the sun and moon to stand still, and it was done. That's found in Joshua 10, verse 12. We here understand that the sacred writers say that all these things were done by faith. It was by faith that the worlds were framed. God spake, chaos heard, and worlds came into order. 
by reason of the faith there there was in him. So with man also he spake by faith in the name of God, and the sun stood still. The moon obeyed, mountains were moved, prisons fell, lion's mouths were closed. The human heart lost its enmity, fire its violence, armies their power, the sword its terror, and death its dominion, and all this by reason of faith which was in them. Had it not been for the faith which was in man, they might have spoken to the sun, the moon, the mountains, prisons, lions, and, uh, the human heart, fires, armies, the sword, or to death in vain. So we looked at those questions. Okay, Is faith anything else beside the principle of action? What is it and how do you prove it? And uh, we then have those scriptures so then we can read them, or that, that, this lecture, so then we can read it, write down our answers, think about the, the answer to those questions, and then we can turn to the answer that is provided to us to double check our work. Now, the answer that, that is provided is that it is. It is also the principle of power. First, it is the principle of power in the deity as well as in man. Hebrews 11.3 Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things were, which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Secondly, it is the principle of power in man also. Book of Mormon, Alma chapter 14, 23-29, Alma and Amulek were delivered from prison. Helaman chapter 5, 37 through 50, Nephi and Lehi with the Lamanites are immersed with the spirit. Ether chapter 12, verse 30, the mountain Zaran, Zaran by the faith of the brother of Jared is removed. Joshua 10, 12, then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, son, stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Hopefully I pronounced that one right. Joshua 10, 13. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves of their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. Matthew 17, 9, verse 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? Matthew 17, 20. And Jesus said unto them, Be, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Hebrews 11.32 and the following verses. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, and other were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Okay, so that's what we have. Now, my commentary is this section specifically, I believe is very self-explanatory. Self Nothing would be done by God. In fact, it says God would cease to exist as he does now without the principle of faith or the attribute of it exercised in him in perfection. If God did not believe, now think about this. If God did not believe that, quote, bringing to pass the immortality and eternal life of man, end quote, had any value to himself, or was even possible, he didn't believe it was possible, he didn't believe it had any value to himself, he would not have made it quote, his work, end quote. That's faith. If it is a principle in deity and we are to become like our Father in heaven, it reasons that faith is never to be done away with. 
it is an attribute that is to be eventually perfected. And that is the, 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 the next section in Lectures on Faith. Any questions on that section? Okay, well, let's go on to the last section of Lecture on Faith number one. And it will be questions number 12 and 13. How would you define faith in its most unlimited sense and how do you convey to the understanding more clearly that faith is the first great governing principle which has power dominion and authority over all things it tells you to go up and read um section 24 section 24 the last paragraph in lecture on faith says faith then is the first great governing principle which has power dominion and authority over all things by it they exist, by it they are upheld, by it they are changed, or by it they remain agreeably to the will of God. Without it, there is no power, and without power, now we have to understand what those, remember, power means what? Without it, there is no power. There is no, uh, inna there is no in enabling, there is no reason there is no motivation. And without power, there could be no creation nor existence. Okay? And then he gives the answer. It is the first great governing principle, which has power, dominion, and authority over all things. Which, by the way, this is, ex I'm just going to reread what I just said, because this answer is literally the same thing. By it they exist, by it they are upheld, by it they are unchanged, or by it they remain agreeably to the will of God, and without it there is no power, and without power there can be no creation nor existence. So he he asks questions, then he sends people to the section, and then the answer to the section is literally the entire section. Okay, this is one of the cases that you're going to run to run into in the lectures on faith, where um, uh, Joseph Smith, uh, uh, the the who is the head of this um, uh, school puts forth a doctrine and basically just wants you to memorize it. He just wants you to memorize it. And you're going to run into that a lot in the lectures on faith. In other locations in the lectures on faith, he will just flat out say, memorize this section. He'll just say, memorize this section. And so this was an important enough section that it is undeviated and unchanging from, uh, from, from the question to the answer. It is the same statement. And so it, he he believed this was golden. So I'll read it one more time so that people can maybe start to gr to grasp this and maybe to um, memorize it. This is one of those things that uh, is really important enough to, that you might want to consider memorizing it. Faith then is the first great governing principle which has power, dominion, and authority over all things. By it they exist, meaning all these things exist. By it, they are upheld, and so they are, they, uh, are ruled. By it, they are changed. So, you know, organization of matter, changing of earths, right? Creating of things. Or by it, they remain, right? So it, it remains in a state unchanged, right? Agreeable to the will of God. Without it, without faith, there is no power, and without power, there could be no creation nor existence. So, you know, there are, are thousands, I would, maybe even, I don't even know, tens of thousands of people in the world that, uh, that are motivational speakers, right? That are like um, motivational um, coach, coaches, a life coach. I think I've heard that, life coach. Um, all of them, whether they, they realize it or not, are grounded in a principle of faith faith and when properly understood and exercised in this principle faith becomes the great motivator it becomes the great action it becomes the power um that in that moves thing forward uh scrolling above what, what were some of those other definitions for the word of uh power 
Um, it produces motion or force um, uh, that may be applied to produce it. Um, uh, it's uh, the faculty of the mind uh, that gives power of thinking, comparing, and judging, reasoning powers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is, this is uh, the great motivator. This is the great doer. This is it. And uh, as uh, President Nelson said in the last conference that uh, lazy learners and lax disciples will not be able to uh, exercise even a particle of faith. And so uh, it, it's, it's a... Um, it's a it's a motivator. It is an action word. It is something that uh, that we're going to need faith as the brother of Jared in order to redeem and build New Jerusalem. That is that is what we need. That is the next steps in the timeline. It it we need um uh, we need to rend the veil of unbelief. Um. Okay, so let's go to some of the con comments here. Um, as we wrap this up. Uh, this last thought process here, Reba says, uh, yes, faith has to be rooted in Jesus Christ. It has to be rooted in Jesus Christ if it is to be to our salvation. People can have faith uh, grounded in, in eternal truths that aren't rooted, that are rooted in Jesus Christ. They just don't know they are. They plant a seed. They put water on it. The sun shines on it. It grows. They're exercising faith. And they're exercising faith in an eternal principle that's ruled right now by by God, but they don't understand it and they don't believe it, right? We need to have faith rooted in Jesus Christ in order to to get unto salvation. So these these um, self help coaches might be able to tap into um, eternal truths that are that flow from the light of Christ, that flow from Jesus Christ. But like, uh, like we go over, like or I do have gone over in the light of Christ, the Holy Ghost, the Second Comforter. Um, there is a, um, there is always that light flowing down, uh, which sometimes is called uh, a, a man's conscience, conscience, um, and people can act on that. But sal uh, faith unto salvation is something that we're going to have to have grounded entirely in the Savior. And, uh, and that's what we're going to have to do there. So, um, like I said, at the end of this, there were some things that, uh, there's only a couple things that were brought up that I thought were really interesting that maybe we should, I should have brought up at the beginning of this, um, regarding the lectures on faith. Now there's been some, uh, uh, uh debate or speculation on who actually wrote, um, the lectures on faith and, um, and how, um, how, uh, reliable are they, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to, to, to me, this one's actually a really easy one to explain really, really quickly to people. Really, really quickly to people. I just ask members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, what does the Doctrine and Covenants mean? So if I'm asking you, uh, 85 people that are listening to this right now, um, what does the Doctrine and Covenants mean? Why do we call that book the Doctrine and Covenants? Does anybody, does anybody in here know why we call that book the Doctrine and Covenants? I'll give you, I'll give you a couple minutes to think about that. Why do we call that the Doctrine and Covenants? The D and C, yes. Why do we call it that? Okay, Derek says, I assume it's called that because that's what it contains. Very astute. Mm-hmm, that's interesting. So, okay. Okay, you're doing a good job of proving this for me. This is good. So you're saying... It's called that because what it contains, the doctrines recorded in it and the covenants, they contain the doctrine or gospel for the covenant people. That's what uh, people are saying. Okay, now what if I told you, um, now what if I told you, oh, Building Zion, I'm going to get to your comments in a sec. They're really good. So what if I told you, um, what if I told you 
that the Doctrine and Covenants used to have in it the lectures on faith. And that the reason why it was called the Doctrine and Covenants was because doctrine referred to the lectures on faith and the covenants dealt with what we refer to as chapters 1 through 100 and whatever it is, 32, 132. Did you know that when the, the lectures on faith were removed, there was a, a, a committee that uh, sat down and tried to decide whether or not they were going to change it from Doctrine and Covenants to just Covenants. Did, did anybody know that? Because what we have in our Doctrine and Covenants isn't technically the Doctrine, it's the Covenants. And if you view, if you under, if we understood what what that meant, uh, if we understood what that meant, we would understand that that when we read the Book of Covenants, that's actually what it should be called. When we read, uh, yes, as Reba says, the Book of Commandments, and isn't that what? Now that's man, you're right on top of me there. That's right, you're right, you're ahead of me there. So and it used to be called the Book of Commandments. Now, what? Now, what's the difference between a commandment and a covenant? Nothing. It's the same thing. A commandment is uh, a commandment is you do this, and I will give you this. That's a commandment. A commandment is it is a is a is a sometimes called a covenant with a promise. That's why it's called, what it's called, a covenant with a promise. I will covenant with you and promise with you something. Okay? So it's called the Book of Book of Commandments or the Book of Covenants. That's synonymous. Okay? The reason why it said doctrine, doctrine, was because of the lectures on faith. That single document, the lectures on faith, was a was what the 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 uh, Joseph Smith deemed to be enough to, to succinctly define the doctrine of Christ. The lectures on faith is the doctrine. The Book of Commandments is um, um, have that. So so that that's the difference between there. So. The, the how do we explain how do we explain um okay so we better not go on to be are asking things not all commandments have blessings or promises okay which can you can you explain that to me antonia so what what commandment do you know that doesn't have a blessing or a promise attached to it Uh, James says, a covenant is a declaration that one agrees to live the commandments. Yay. Don't we make covenants when we're married? Don't we make covenants when we're baptized? Don't we make covenants when we're in the temple? The first commandment. So the first commandment is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, mind, and strength. Okay? And you, okay, and what you're saying is that does not have a blessing or a promise attached to it. I believe that that you could easily point to Doctrine Gummins chapter 45 and find uh the the promise blessing or promise associated with keeping that commandment. Uh, we can also turn to Doctrine and Covenants, I believe it's 87, and read about um, those that uh, those that obtain the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. And it says in there that these are they that obeyed every word as it proceeded forth from the mouth of God. So every, uh, every, uh, uh, commandment. Even thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
They also keep the, the Sabbath day holy. Some have an immediate promise next to it, but all commandments, everything that the Lord says, in Doctrine and Covenants 45, the Savior says, um, Lord, these people are those that, that loved me and believed uh, in me. Let them come in under the kingdom of my Father. They did everything that was asked of me. Okay, so every every commandment comes, uh, every covenant with the Lord comes with a blessing uh, attached to it. Whether that is something immediate that we know exactly what it is. So like, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the, the land which the Lord thy God shall give thee. That That's one that you can have, there's a direct one that we actually can look to and see. But all of them actually have a blessing associated with it. We learn in the Doctrine and Covenants that uh, no man at any time obtains any blessing save upon obedience upon which, uh, upon obedience upon the principle upon which it is based. So obedience to all blessings uh, Okay, so together the commandments do have inferred or direct but singly no. I, you're gonna have to explain that one to me a little bit better. I don't. I don't. T to me, I don't understand. I, I'm not really grasping the difference there. Uh, this individual says, "Doctrine comes also contains the doctrine as well as commandments. Commandments are explained with doctrine, and doctrine is explained with references to the scriptures." And and see, uh, uh, Christopher, that is exactly the argument that was being had back then. So that you're you're just uh, describing one side of the argument there. And that's exactly what they're saying. So um, anything that's canonized, anything that canon is canonized then, um, you could then say is doctrine. Okay, well then the lectures on faith at one point in time were canonized. And so, um, and God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, so you can't uncanonize something. Uh, and make it, uh, you can uncanonize something but that doesn't. Uh, that's a to the topic for a whole. In fact, that was one of our very first, uh, very first, uh, one of our very first uh, firesides of about the difference between those things. Every word, uh, every word that proceeded forth from the mouth of God, you could then say is potentially doctrine. The lectures on faith. The lectures on faith contains the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the doctrine of faith. And and, and that's what that the whole Lectures on Faith uh, uh, goes to, goes over and goes through. But that is not um, entirely um, what every scripture goes through, right? And so the, the, the way that we can go about discussing the doctrine versus the covenants the commandments versus the doctrine. Um, and here's the other, uh, and wh where was this going with this? So wh what was the whole point of going through this? The whole point of going through this was is that, is that uh, the early brethren of the church tacked this on and called it the doctrine and covenants. Okay, that, that's what they tacked on there. And we have uh, scriptures in the doctrine and covenant, in the doctrine and covenants that said that, uh, that we will receive the commandments, we will receive the commandments and the doctrine in this generation through the mouth of Joseph Smith. Okay, that so it was going to be given to us, right, through Joseph Smith. And then our very first book, The Doctrine and Covenants, contained the lectures on faith. So here's here, so do I believe that that these are Joseph Smith's lectures on faith? Yes. Even if Signy was majorly involved in in writing it, they like here's here's the thing, um, the preach my gospel. Do we believe that Gordon B. Hinckley wrote every word of that book? Do we believe that the apostles sat down and wrote every single word of that book? But would we not say that that? book because it had gone through the canonizing process uh before it, before it was published and by the way preach my gospel is a lot different than come follow me right preach my gospel had many years uh of of being done 
and, and the canonizing process. Come Follow Me was something that, that they produced uh, pretty speedily within one year. A little, little different. But um, do we believe that they read everything? Right? Do we, do we, or wrote everything, not read everything. Do we believe they read, uh, wrote everything? But wouldn't we still say that it is um, uh, the doctrine of the church? Preach my gospel is uh, the current, uh, uh, current standard for missionary work um, in the church. Likewise, um, the, the lectures on faith, even if Sidney Rignan was involved in heavily writing them, the, the school of the prophets was Joseph Smith's. The, the doctrine and the covenants were supposed to represent the doctrine and the covenants from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and it was put in there. And it was put in there to, together. So the, the early brethren who were told to memorize these things, who were told to learn these things, and then later moved to the West when Sidney Rinnan stayed behind, they still chose to, stuck, to, to put this in a book and call it The Doctrine and Covenants. If, if, this, if this book was Sidney Rignan's Lectures on Faith and, and it had no validation at all, it, it had no stamp of approval at all from uh, Joseph Smith, why was it then canonized as The Doctrine and Covenants? Why, why would the brethren, after Sidney was uh, excommunicated and left, why would they why would they take that document stick it in the in with all of the covenants and make a book called the doctrine and covenants over it so i i don't believe that that personally i don't believe that 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 holds any water um to to, to say that that joseph had nothing to do with the lectures and that it was entirely sydney sydney Riggins and that it wasn't doctrine because the entire reason why we get the name the doctrine and covenants is because of this document Without this document, we don't have the Doctrine and Covenants. We just have the Book of Commandments. We just have the Covenants. And that's just uh, the fact of history at this point in time. So um, that's where I stand on that. Everything else is speculation. We don't know. So we, we Joseph Smith writer for, m might have written all of it. We don't know, right? Um, we don't. We don't know. So that's where I where we stand on that. That's where we understand. I would recommend, there was actually a um, BYU group um, that did a series on uh, uh, the Lectures on Faith, I'm trying to remember it, and uh, there was an old gentleman in the group, I'm trying to remember it, um, that, that went over this entire thing that I went over today, that how it used to be called the Doctrine and Covenants, and... Um, uh, when it was removed, there was talk that it should have been just changed back to the covenants and, uh, and, and yada, yada, yada. So you might want to go check out that too. If you're still thinking about that, you still want to do some research, research on that. Um, go back and, and check that out. So, um, yeah, it used to be called the doc, uh, doctrine covenants because of that. So, So what I'm trying to get at here is that there's a lot of people who want to throw out the lectures of faith as though they're not important, like it's not doctrine. And what I'm getting at is that we, we wouldn't even have what we call as the doctrine and covenants without the lectures on faith. So the And you could go back and check out those BYU professors uh, that I was just describing. They also had, a like I said, a section where they talked about this as well, where we, we, do, we don't have the doctrine and covenants without that. We don't have we don't have the word doctrine in that without the lectures on faith, and so um, they didn't think Brigham Young, the, the Taylor, the, the first whatever it was six seven eight uh, prophets of the church did not believe that we could have the doctrine and the covenants together without the lectures on faith, and then when when it was finally decided that we should probably remove. Um, the lectures on faith, there was a debate on whether or not we should change the name back to the Book of Commandments or the Book of Covenants. And, and so, um, not something that I was trying to get into in great depth in here today, Christopher, just something that I wanted to get people to think about and realize that um, uh, when they're um, trying to take the, the lectures on faith down a peg, that... Um, that they're they're inadvertently, in my estimation, um, taking down the doctrine and covenants a peg. 
Um, said they were pulled in 1921 because they were moved because they were not specific revelations of the church according to the preface. Um, uh, actually, the reason why they were pulled was because Talmadge at the time had issue with a single line in one of the lectures on faith. So that was actually why they were pulled, primarily due to uh, an elder Talmadge. So. And you're right, they weren't specific revelations to the church. And specific revelations to the church would contain in them what? Covenants. Covenants, which is why they wanted to change the name from doctrine to covenants. So the concept was is that members needed to learn the doctrine themselves by just reading the standard works. What the lectures on faith was, was an attempt to get the doctrine uh, from the standard works, was to get the doctrine from the standard works and summarize it in a way that people could have in their hand in, in a small document. That, that was the whole purpose of the lectures on faith. So, um, James, the one line that uh, Elder Talmadge had a problem with that because it was confusing members um, was the line that the father is a personage of spirit. So, um, and taken out of context, um, uh, uh, people were saying, well, does that mean that God doesn't have a body? And, uh, and so, because members couldn't figure out what was, they couldn't read the couple sentences around it, which we're going to get into in the other election on faith. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, they lost their mind. And so, uh, that he didn't like that it was confusing members because um, God is a um, personage of spirit, but he is also a personage of tabernacle. And so he didn't like how uh, it said there was a line that says God is a personage of spirit. But that does not mean that God does not have a physical body, right? Um, another one of those ones that really drives people crazy, but we haven't removed it yet, is Abinadi's teaching of the Godhead. Um, that's another one that people will read and, and they'll scratch their head and they'll say, what the heck was Abinadi trying to say here? Um, but we haven't removed that from the Book of Mormon. So, so anyway, so that, that's what I would say about that. So for, in my, if you don't, if people don't like that, that's fine. I refer to them as, as, as Joseph Smith's lectures on faith. Okay. Um, I, I will refer to them as Joseph Smith's lecture on faith because it was his school and it was his organization, and he was then um, um, the, the the head of that. And so that's just my where I'm going to stand on that. You can call them whatever you want. You want to call them just a lecture on faith. You want to call them Sidney Ravens lecture on faith. You can call them whatever you want. Uh, my my estimation is is that 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 Joseph Smith had a lot more. And by the way, I've read um, uh, the teaching of the prophet Joseph Smith multiple times. I, I I've read Joseph's words a lot. And Joseph had a very unique way of writing and a unique way of teaching, a very unique way of teaching. And um, it was st so different from the Doctrine and Covenants and so different from the Book of Mormon. Like, it, it, they are com three different, completely different voices. It, it's not even remotely the same. And reading the lectures on faith and reading the teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, if you cannot see, if you cannot see that, that, that this was either written by Joseph or highly, highly, highly influenced by him, then you haven't read enough Joseph Smith. Right? That that is just uh, uh, my uh, straightforward thought process on that. So Linny says here, the lectures on faith become cliff notes for the scriptures. Yes, that was that was the the concept of them originally. The concept of them originally was how do we because because understand what was the lectures on faith. The lectures on faith were what, what was set up in the school of the prophets before these people went off on missions. So what they were trying to do is to summarize the doctrine of Christ down into, yes, cliff notes, so that they would then know how to go off and do this. So at the same time, by the way, around the same time, we have what? We have the lectures on faith. We have those, uh, those, uh, those many, many meetings that were going off in the School of the Prophets. We also had the Articles of Faith. It was all of this, this process of like trying to break down and summarize the doctrine in a way as simply as possible so that we could then expect missionaries to... It was like our memorized discussions or our Preach My Gospel, Right? 
So that's uh, so yeah. So James says it was just that one line. Yes, it was that one line. Uh, there's no other line that was a problem. It was that one line. So um, if you understand what he's for what what they're saying when they say God is a person of spirit, um, and then read the, the the other things around it, then yeah. That was the only line that they had a problem with. And that was the only reason why they even thought about get, taking it out. That one line. And so, um, that's what we have there. So, so CES teachers are, are shying away from teaching things. They teach the milk. I think that um, Miller, I think that the reason why they do that is because of basically what we're seeing here with the lectures on faith. Um, the lectures on faith attempted to, to, and by the way, which we saw with Mormon doctrine, the book by Bruce R. McConkie. Every, uh, see, and, and people, here's another, I forgot to mention this. Why did Bruce write Mormon doctrine? The, why did he write Mormon doctrine? Why did he call it Mormon doctrine? Because the lectures on faith were taken out of the book of commandments and we no longer had a summarized what Bruce at the time called Mormon doctrine. So what and what Bruce was attempting to do, Elder Bruce R. McConkie was attempting, attempting to do with uh, uh, Mormon doctrine was create standardized cliff notes for the doctrine of the church. Mormon doctrine. It was refused and refused, and then eventually he just gave up. And so um, there has been a conscious effort, conscious effort, post-Elder Talmadge, 1921, there's been a conscious effort uh, of the church to disband or get away from any centralized understanding of, of doctrine in the church. We don't like we we like the lectures on faith, uh, Elder Bruce Armour Conkey's Mormon doctrine. Like they they want people just to go to the standard works and figure it out themselves. Uh, they they do not want people to go to these um, centralized locations, if you will, and uh, and and just glean everything from them. Include which would, by the way, include people like myself. And the reason why they don't want people doing this is because you get too attached to a person and not to the volumes uh, of scripture and volumes of doctrines or the concerts of clarity, as Elder Bednar says. And if the individual uh, is wrong on the subject, then you, you've you learned something wrong, right? And there are a lot of individuals that will go off and preach opinions and preach um, speculations, and they'll do a lot of opining, and uh, that that happens and the church doesn't want that to happen they don't want any centralized doctrine they would rather have people go to the standard works themselves and figure it out themselves and so they they the reason why they they don't do this and they teach milk is because every time that they have attempted to try to centralize the doctrine it becomes not only it becomes so messy it 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 makes people have to ask questions right? So we have to ask questions like, what is the doctrine on blank? What is the doctrine on blank? And then all of a sudden, there's a lot of really icky questions and a lot of really sticky answers that nobody wants to go into, right? And frankly, we we aren't ready to go into, right? Because it, it, it would just, um, as uh, 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 President Monson uh, so eloquently put it in that story that he shared, about the uh, chickens and uh, burning of the debris. Uh, you know, if we burn the debris, if we do that, the chickens won't lay their eggs anymore. And so uh, we don't want, there's a, a, a steering away from a lot of that. And, and I don't believe that that's going to, that's going to change until the veil of unbelief is broken. And then, you know, things are going to start coming through like a floodgate. So. Yeah, so Andrew here is actually, um, 
Andrew here has actually put the one line there. That's the one line. The Father being a personage of spirit, glory, and power, possessing all perfection and fullness. Okay? Now, what do we know about fullness? Right? So what does it mean to have the possession of fullness? Uh, we cannot have a perfection and fullness without the body. Right? And so, um, yes, the Father definitely has a body, but that uh, that was blowing people's minds. So... I, I'm, I'm skipping over stuff here. I don't know if there's anything else here. Uh, was there any more questions on the lecture on faith? Because I want to say a closing prayer and then we can get into some Q&A here. But what I really wanted to, to go over with the, that, that doctrine thing is, is, is just that. I believe it's a doctrine. I believe that. And pre frankly, President Nelson believes it's doctrine because he, he quoted and referenced the lectures on faith um, in his uh, last conference talk. And so that's just, that is just where I stand on that. Um, people might have a differencing opinion on that. Same with the, um, same thing with the, um, uh, you know, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I believe it's doctrine. I believe that it's, I know that it's why it was called the Doctrine and Covenants. And, uh, and I know why it was taken out. And I also know what was being said there, being the father, being a person of spirit. I know what that means. But I know that there was a lot of people who were confused about that. But likewise, there's a lot of people reading Mosiah that get really, and not just uh, Abinadi in the book of Mosiah, to get really confused about the Godhead there because um, Abinadi says some things there that would also lead one to be very confused about the Godhead. Um, but we haven't removed that from the Book of Mormon, right? That's still doctrine. And uh, so that's still a part of our canonized uh, words. So... But you're gonna have a you're gonna have problems with that. We don't we don't like to in the church, um, we don't like to uh, create a a standardized definition of, of of doctrine. That's why the what what we do have in like the Bible dictionary, and we have a, a book called the True to the Faith. What you'll find is that that True to the Faith has like I don't even know seventy words in it. Like it and it only answers things like. What is, you know, what is obedience? Like, it, it, it's very, very, very basic. And uh, the, the reason for that is because we as saints just, like uh, President Nelson said, we're lazy learners and lax disciples. So um, until we, we learn the doctrine and not learn this stuff, we're not going to be getting more of it. So, so anyway, that was my entire purpose of that entire thing. We need to understand why it was called the Doctrine and Covenants. We need to understand that the, the, the lectures on faith used to be a part of that. We need to understand that Joseph was in charge of the, the school of these missionaries. It was his calling. We need to understand that the Doctrine and Covenants did state, uh, the Lord did state in the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, or the Book of Commandments, that, that we will receive uh, the words uh, and the doctrine um, through Joseph Smith's mouth as though they were from the Lord's own mouth. And that this dispensation will have the Lord's words through him, okay? And uh, and and that's that was what was said. And so, if we have if we have the the lectures on faith, and we have the early prophets and apostles in Salt Lake City putting them together and creating a book called the Doctrine and Covenants, and um, and including it in there, I believe that there is substantial. Um, evidence to support at least the claim that Brigham Young, John Taylor, Lorenzo Snow, um, George Albert Smith, there is substantial enough evidence to support the claim that those individuals thought that it was doctrine. And um, so frankly, that's frankly, that's good enough for me. So and uh, so if other people want to have a difference of, of uh, opinion on that, um, that's totally fine. Don't take offense when I call them Joseph Smith's lectures on faith. When I call them a uh, uh, doctrine, please don't take offense on that. That's as my personal standpoint on that. Um, when the prophet of God and uh, and the apostles come out and they change church policy regarding something, um, uh, it's my policy to make the same changes. So same changes. And so um, that's just where I stand. Right. Um, and uh, that's where I'm going to stand with that. OK, is there any other questions on this lectures on faith? Number one.
Hey, Brett. And James says it, it does make sense to get people to figure it out for themselves. I agree. And uh, I believe that, and, and I know that's why they were doing it and why they didn't really, they didn't like um, uh, Bruce Armour Conkey's attempt to to centralize it, to centralize the concept of, of what our doctrine is. They didn't like it. And Bruce Armour Conkey, in fact, went into the apostles and said, tell me what I need to do or what we need to do in order to to make this right so what do you have a problem with in the book and they were they wouldn't even give him feedback on it so like they wouldn't even they, like that, that's why eventually bruce on mcconkey elder bruce on just gave up on it and what you'll find is that elder bruce on then for the rest of his life started disseminating or tearing apart his his book um uh mormon doctrine into um elder bruce on mcconkey's New Testament commentary. So what you'll find, what you'll find is that uh, you'll find these books called like Elder Bruce McConkie's um, uh, New Testament commentary, and you'll read it and you'll go, "Wow, this is taken word for word out of uh, uh, Bruce McConkie's Mormon doctrine." So eventually, he just totally gave up on it. And uh, you, in fact, you can't even you can't even buy a copy of the book anymore. They don't even publish it anymore, and so they, they really didn't like that. Um, so um, they don't like that centralizing of doctrine. And maybe the reason for that is because uh, a, a little bit because uh, it's Joseph Smith's job to do that centralizing. So maybe that's maybe that's part of the reason. And so maybe a, 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 some of this is getting us to do it on our own. But maybe some of it is maybe some of this is uh, it's not their calling and responsibility. It's in this dispensation. So they're just not going to do it. So. Hopefully that, hopefully that makes a little more sense. Right? So, anyway, so uh, Brian says here, fullness of God's attributes, power, etc. Yes, and uh, fullness of God's attributes, powers, and etc. would include his body. And so we just have to understand that. Um, okay, is there any more questions on, um, is there any more questions on the lectures on faith? I think Building Zion had some on the lectures on faith up here. I'm going to scroll up real quick. Okay, so she said... And then we're going to say a closing prayer, and then we can get into Q&A. But I wanted to keep it on lectures on faith before I said my closing prayer here. Um, okay, James up here says, Why do you think that the lectures on faith are by Joseph Smith when some church manuals say it is unknown who wrote the lectures? Hopefully I answered that, James. Um, the church manuals do say, and I've, I hopefully I've explained that clearly, they do say they do not know who wrote them. Right? Um, to, to me, this is the difference... Do you know what this is to me? Maybe another way of explaining this is thus. When Jesus Christ was over in the Middle East and he explained the parable of the sowers, right? He said that the son of man is the one that sows the good seed. Okay, he says, I'm the one that sows the good seed. But then later in the Doctrine and Covenants, when, when talking to Joseph Smith, he said, the apostles were the one that sowed the good seed. Okay, which was it? You know, were they Jesus Christ's seed or were they um, worthy of the apostles' seed? Which was it? Which seed? Whose seed were they? Right? Who wrote that seed? Right? And so if you go up far enough, if you go up far enough, were they even Joseph Smith's lectures on faith? No, they were probably Jesus Christ's lectures on faith. Right? And so... This is, this is, the, the, so even if Signy Rignan was involved in writing it, it was Joseph Smith's school. He was, he was the, the, the architect of the school. He was the head of the school. He's the one who organized it, right? And so, um, whether by, right, if the, if the prophet says something, don't we say, whether, whether by my voice or the voice of my servant, it is the same. So at that point in time, the, 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 the arguing between whether or not it was Joseph Smith or Sidney Rignan who wrote the words down it, it is, a, is, a, is a moot point. Joseph Smith didn't write a single word down. Not a single word down, as far as we know, regarding the translation of the Book of Mormon. Yet we say... It's Joseph Smith's translation. But he didn't write any of the words down. 
So Sidney Rinnan might have written every single word down in the lectures on faith, but you know, so but was it Sidney Rigdon? Was it Joseph Smith? Was it the Savior? You know, I, I think that that's that is explained. I think that the early prophets and apostles, once again, before I say the closing prayer, I believe it. The early prophets and apostles made it abundantly clear that they believed that it was doctrine because they put it in a book and labeled it doctrine and covenants. And doctrine, the word doctrine dealt, was specifically targeted at the lectures on faith. So I, I believe that that answers the, the, the question definitively. But um, people, people can arrive at their own uh, conclusions on that, right? So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that you can understand why I say it that way. If people don't want, to, and by the way, when we buy the lectures on faith, so if you go online and you buy the lectures on faith from um, the church or you go buy the lectures on faith from uh, the, the church's website or like go look at them in other places, uh, I don't think you can buy it on the church's website. Um, it will say, like it, to this day, it'll say Joseph Smith's lectures on faith. And so like, that's just the way we buy it. And so um, anyway, that's what I'm going to do. I'm sorry if that offends people. If you want to go on believing that, that, that Joseph had nothing whatsoever to do with these lectures that were taught in, in the church, in his school, with Joseph Smith present, that's fine. Like that's totally up to you. But uh, um, I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, on that belief. So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that we, you know, it, it, once again, uh, that is uh, me arriving at a conclusion. That is not doctrine. So I think it's, uh, I think it speaks for itself, but people can do their, their own conclusions on that. Okay. That makes sense. So I have, a, I've gotten a lot of emails about that. So I'm, I'm not going to change that one. So if a prophet of God stands up, if, if Joseph Smith returns and says, ugh, I don't like the, the lectures aren't faith. Wow. What was Brigham Young and John Taylor and Lorenzo Snow? Man, how did they get that so wrong? I had nothing to do with that. Ugh, yucky. If, if that happened, okay. Hey, pfft, okay. I don't understand that, but man, I'm throwing it out. But until that happens, until a source high enough comes out and does that, um, I'm going to continue to call them Joseph Smith's lectures on faith, and I'm going to still view them as a uh, doctrine. So, and uh, President Nelson views them as doctrine as well, because if he didn't view them as doctrine or a value, he would not have quoted it in his last conference and then referenced it. So that's where I stand on that. So anyway, I blabbed way too long on that one subject of Joseph Smith's lectures on faith. So we are going to say a closing prayer. And then I will hopefully be able to get to answering some of these people's questions uh, uh, on this, okay? All right. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this day. We are grateful for our many blessings. Father, we're grateful for the doctrine that thou has provided for us in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, the doctrine and covenants. Pro great price, Father. We're grateful for all that thou has given to us and all the knowledge and the standard works that thou has given unto us to a study. We're grateful for the lectures on faith. We're grateful for the Prophet Joseph Smith Jr. and for his contribution to the world. We're grateful for, for his love that he had for thee and thy son Jesus Christ and his willingness to lay down his life for those things that he knew to be true. Father, we pray that we can obtain that same level of faith to be able to lay down our life for that uh, which we know to be true, that we may be able to live our lives in a way that will be pleasing to thee and that we will be able to exercise faith in thee that will be sufficient for us to obtain salvation in thee and thy son. Father, we love thee and we're grateful for thee and the knowledge of thee. We pray that we can always remain grateful for all the things that we do have and that we can continue to put thee first in our life. And uh, we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, okay. There you go. We've ended, the, ended that fireside here. We can now go into any one of these questions. So, if anybody wanted to still talk about um, why we don't why we don't believe it should be called Joseph Smith Lectures on Faith, we can. If if somebody else wants to ask questions on somebody else, or if they they think I'm conf confused on something, oh, uh, if people were still more confused about uh, commandments, I'd like to get and pick Antonia's brain a little bit further on that. That was that was confusing to me. I didn't quite uh, uh, so what the distinction that she was making there. I would love to. I would love to pick her brain a little bit more on that one because uh, all 
all commandments of the Lord are spiritual. And so that means that they all come with some sort of blessing. We just might not know what that promise is. So that was another interesting one that I've, I've actually never heard somebody explain that any other way. So if somebody wanted to uh, give that a shot, I'd be curious as to what people's thoughts on that work because uh, commandments are covenants. And uh, when we obtain any promise, uh, when we when we obey any commandment and then receive the blessing associated with that covenant or promise, we are obtaining the blessings promised to the house of Israel. So that that is a, a I thought a pretty uh, standardized understanding. But if it's not, I, I would really like to hear some people's uh, other people's breakdown of that in another way. Um, so I'm just gonna scroll down here. Um, Andrew asks here, through faith, faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so the things which are seen were not made of things that do appear. Okay, so basically, um, what, that the worlds were, were, and we get this a little bit more in, in the Doctrine and Covenants, Andrew, so um, there is no creation or destruction of, of matter. There are only things that are organized. And through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed. So the framing means organized by the word of God. So the things which, you know, we were seen, right? The things that we've, we experience right now and that are, are, are not things that have always existed in this state, right? And so faith is what enables us to, like how we go over in the lectures on faith, by faith, things remain in the state that they're in. By faith, things can change from state to state. By faith, things are upheld in their current state. And so uh, what what Paul is uh, teaching here in Hebrews is just that concept there. He, he's using it in very strange language to us, but that's just the concept of what he's trying to teach there, So, which uh, hopefully makes a little more sense in the actual lectures on faith. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Okay. I think this means God organized the world of existing material. I could be wrong, though. Should have scrolled down, Andrew. You the man. That's right. Um, okay, so here's the Building Zion ones I want to get back to. We want things to be handed to us instead of using faith. That's right. The power in God to move forward and obtain the promises given by God. That's right. That's a, that's a good way of putting it. She continues, I think being a lazy learner is a mild statement. We are lazy ministers, missionaries, and so on and so on because we have no faith in God's promises and we just want. That's accurate. And, and, and that's right, right? So because we don't believe in the promised blessings, right? Or maybe we're a little bit confused and we don't believe that certain commandments have a promised blessing. Right, like maybe that's something. That, another thing that maybe we're, we're confused on that we don't believe that when we're obedient to any commandment, that there is a blessing. We might not understand it. We might not. We might not have it explicitly laid out. But if we, if we have real faith, we know that by being a good minister, by being a good missionary, we know and have faith that those promises that the Lord has given to us, that he will fulfill them. He'll give it to us. Instead, we don't believe, we don't believe in the connection between our actions and the rewards. And we simply just think that due to the Lord's compassion and us being his children, we can just plead for, plead to him and he'll just dish out um, the, the, um, the rewards to us. So yeah, I, that's a, that's a very good, uh, very good understanding of why we need to, um, uh, why we need to understand faith, right? Very good. Okay, so I'm scrolling down here. That I want to scroll up because I want to read that. Oh wait, here's another one from Building Zion. Read the first four books of the old of the Old Testament. And the doctrine comes at the same time. You'll be blown away at how similar they are. We complain that we don't understand the Bible. 
Yeah, that's accurate. We The biggest thing is the language barrier, I think, in some cases, and they don't understand dualism. So they don't understand they, they don't understand how a lot of these prophecies were dualistic in nature, or how a lot of these events, such as the the uh, Moses in Egypt and and all these things, were types, and Joseph in Egypt were types of things to happen in the last days. And so we don't we don't see the value in in studying it. Antonia um, was doing some really good studying and breakdown of uh, Moses and the redemption or are they uh, escape from. Uh, and all the plagues and such. She was doing a very good, a uh, very interesting breakdown of that, but but not just the breakdown. Trying to understand how this type might be played out in our day, and I think that I think that if we we think more in those terms, I think that that the scriptures become a lot more alive to a lot more people, and they start to think, oh my god, they start to realize, oh my goodness, this is us today. So, um, so hopefully that, uh, hopefully, um. So I'm scrolling back down now. So I've just gone through uh, Building Zion. So we're going to go back down to the bottom now. Those are really good points. Um, those are really good points. Okay, so Caden here asks, you mentioned the veil of unbelief being broken. Um, the, the scriptural, what they say in the scripture is the veil of unbelief, I think, being rent. But yeah, it's just, it's the same word. Is this an event that happens in proximity to any identifiable points of reference? Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, we know that the, the veil of unbelief has to be rent before we get the sealed portion. And we also learn in Ether chapter 4 that the veil of unbelief has to be rent before people will actually start to understand the book of Revelation. And then it also says in Ether chapter 4 that the veil of unbelief has to be rent before people will be able to understand the book of Revelation. And then once they understand the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation will actually start to take place in reality. So um, there is definitely some points of, and we also know that the veil of unbelief being rent um, is closely tied to the points of reference around Joseph Smith's return. So there is definitely some, some good points of reference around um, the veil of unbelief. And that being where we are right now. And tearing of the veil of unbelief, or renting of it, is done through faith. Faith as the brother of Jared. Which is exactly why hearing him and uh, the focus on faith, I believe, has been so intense by our prophet for the last two to three years. So, um, hopefully that answers that question. Um, and by the way, I'm, once again, I'm looking for the two LDS archives. Um, and so, you know, I am, I am looking at that. I just, I just saw Reba here say at the two Micah. <laughs> so I, 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 if I don't, if it's not the two LDS archives, it doesn't show as up as orange and I might miss it. And so some people might be saying things like, I've been asking for weeks, a question, you don't answer it and you're skipping it. If you don't put the at the two LDS archives, I might skip it because it, there's a lot of words here in white. I'm only looking at the ones with in the orange, and so it's not it's not because I don't like you or I'm or I think your question is too tough. It's just I, I don't I didn't see it. Okay, so um, please no hard feelings on that one. So uh, her question here is: Do you recommend Mormon doctrine? Is it a good source? Um, I believe that. Uh, uh, well, I know. Let's start with what I know. I know that Elder Bruce M. Conkey was an apostle, and so that means something, but it doesn't mean anything by itself. Uh, an apostle all by himself cannot declare or um, or a withdrawal, withdraw the uh, teaching of doctrine, and so it doesn't mean anything by itself. Um, I believe that Mormon doctrine has been, is a fantastic source in that Bruce Armour Conkey in that book, book does a fantastic job sourcing all of his stuff, okay? As with anything, as with anything, the way I personally, my, and everyone needs to have this, everyone needs to understand their pyramid of truth, their hierarchy and pyramid of truth, 
and where they where they rank stuff. And a lot of people will put quote unquote the Holy Ghost, quote unquote their spirit o meter and they'll put it at the very very top and i can tell you quant right off the bat unequivocally that that is going to get you into a ton of trouble and that is going to get you to follow false spirits and that is going to get you in a very bad position okay the the, the top of the pyramid is the words of jesus christ in the flesh or words in the of jesus christ in the flesh in the past that would include the new testament that would include the, Bo the Book of Mormon where Jesus was talking. That would include if the risen Lord himself came and visited you and you confirmed that it was Jesus Christ and not an angel of darkness. Okay? Uh, and there, there, this does not happen to, you know, every Joe up the street. Okay? Th th this event occurs when you're having your calling an election made sure. This does not happen for people that are, you know, in their 20s and, uh, and, uh, you know, have spent most of their life in a band and just decided to turn their life around last year. That is not how ha one has their calling an election major. So this is an event that will not take place for the grand majority of us. Okay. I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, Elder Bruce McConkey said this is this is not going to happen for the grand majority of members of the church. Uh, and he was an apostle. So um, and a lot of others have said something very similar. So that's the top of the pyramid for me. But it's something that I'm not expecting to happen on a daily basis, okay? I'm not expecting to have a question of, for example, lectures on faith. And then go, okay, is the lectures on faith, you know, blank or blank? And then Jesus Christ to be like, I'll just call him up and be like, okay, hey, Jesus, come on down, okay? Come on down and teach me this, okay? It's not going to happen. It, it, very, you know, it's, it's not going to happen frequently. It didn't happen frequently for the apostles, Right? It, it happened so infrequently that when Jesus, when when Peter found out that it was Jesus on the shore, Peter jumped into the water and swam to the shore. He couldn't even wait to get to the Savior. This is not something that that just because you've you've you know had your calling and election made sure, you're you're seeing Jesus every other day. Like that that is not what this means. Okay, so that's the top of the pyramid, right under um, the 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 Savior. Because here's the thing: you say, well, what about God? Okay. Well, we when we became fallen, Jesus became the mediator and speaker for the Father. We don't have a connection to the Father, save it be through the Son. We do not have that. Okay. And so, um, the Son says it. The Father says it. For all intents and purposes, the the Son represents the Father. Directly underneath the Son, we have the prophet of your dispensation. That is the head, and, and not the prophet of your current time period, the prophet of the head of your dispensation. Okay, that's a big deal. Okay, Peter was a big deal. Okay, it, it, the head of your dispensation is a big deal. Okay, because he is the head of your dispensation. Adam is a big deal. Okay, so right under them, you have the, 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 the head of your dispensation. Right under the head of your dispensation, you have the standardized works. And the standardized works are almost always determined by the head prophet of your dispensation. Okay? So we have the standardized works right under them. Right underneath the standardized works, we have modern prophets. Right underneath modern prophets, we have modern apostles. Right underneath modern prophet, uh, apostles, you have everyone else. Okay? Okay? That is how I work my my um, my um, pyramid of truth. Now, where would I put Mormon doctrine on that? Okay, he is an apostle, so he would be go down an apostle. Okay, what? But I need concerts of clarity. If there is something taught in Mormon doctrine, but it is not taught anywhere else, meaning I don't have a quote from from Jesus Christ, I don't have a quote from Joseph Smith, I don't have a quote from any of the standardized works. Then I throw it out, okay? Then I throw it out. What if there's a conflict? What if Joseph Smith said, um, you know, tic-tac-toe is God's favorite game. And a modern prophet said, um, um, checkers is God's favorite game. Okay, where, do my, where would I then mark that? I would say I stick with Joseph Smith, okay? So if there's ever a conflict with anything below the pyramid of truth, with something above it, I go with what's above it, okay? 
my spirit o meter my holy ghost that only kicks in when everything that i do have available to me on the pyramid of truth is not working so i don't so for example i go to i have a question i go to um the, jesus christ i can't find any words specifically that he said on that he hasn't come to me in person to explain this i go to joseph smith all the teachings of the prophet joseph smith I can't find anything in there. And by the way, I, I, I should have mentioned here, words of Jesus Christ, doctrine and covenants would also include that. So I didn't, I didn't, I totally forgot to mention that. So words of Jesus Christ would be um, pretty explicitly the words of Jesus Christ would be New Testament, um, when he appeared to the Nephites and third Nephite, as well as then the doctrine and covenants, okay? So then I go to Joseph Smith. I don't have that anything there. I then go to mo modern prophets and, and then I go to modern apostles. I got nothing. Then I can go to the Lord and I can pray and I can say, God, show me the way. God, show me the way. Then I qualify for the, the, the guidance of the Holy Ghost. But if the answer is given to me by Jesus and it's given to me by Joseph and it's given to me by modern prophets and apostles and it's given to me in, in the standard works, it's given to me in all those locations and then I decide to go off and pray and then the quote unquote Holy Ghost tells me to do the opposite of everything that they've said. You can know with a surety that you're being led by false spirits and devils. And you, you disqualified yourself for the Holy Ghost by not heeding the words of Jesus Christ, uh, Joseph Smith, the standard works, um, the, the modern prophets and apostles, you've disregarded all of them. So you've disqualified yourself from the Holy Ghost. And by disqualifying yourself and then tempting and praying and asking for help, you have welcomed in the, the, the evil spirits and the devils, as uh, uh, many people have said, uh, uh, including that, that quote I like to read from President Joseph Fielding Smith. So, the, And then you'll be led by, the, by something not good. So where do I put Mormon Doctrine? Right there, right there with the apostles, um, and uh, you know, and apostles are great, but if there's no nothing to to confirm them with, or if there's something higher on the the scale that that, that somebody has said, I overrule it. Okay, so um, if 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 Elder Bruce McConkey in in his book Mormon Doctrine says the sky is blue, but I have a quote from Joseph Smith that says the sky is purple. I'm going to throw it out. Okay, that's just how the 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 hierarchy of truth works. And everyone needs to decide their where their own hierarchy of truth is. I can I believe with my hierarchy of truth, I can prove it doctrinally why it needs to be that for everybody who has a testimony of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but people are going to have to decide what that is for themselves. I'm very straightforward with my hierarchy of truth. And so um scholars um, scholars, I put at the very, 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 very bottom. I, I value the words of scholars um, no more, no less than my own words. So um, they, they, they have no value. Uh, more, they have no more value than my own or um, yours. So, so okay. I was a long answer to that, but I, I, that's, a, that's a good question. How do I feel about uh, Bruce Omar Conkey's Mormon doctrine? Um, the physical book says the lectures on faith prepared by the prophet Joseph Smith. Okay. Well, there you go. Right. And so, um, so Antonia says she has a copy of the book that says prepared by the prophet Joseph Smith. Okay. So uh, it's like, you know, okay, here's another, here's, a, here's another perfect way of explaining this. How many people like cooking shows? How many people like cooking shows? Now, if you have Gordon Ramsay as the head of your, sh your cooking crew, if anything comes out from the back of that kitchen, can Gordon Ramsay say, oh, I didn't cook that? I didn't prepare that? Can he do that? No, he is in charge of the kitchen, right? He is in charge of that. The book, The Lectures on Faith, prepared by the prophet Joseph Smith, okay? Um, it, it does not matter if, if Joseph Smith did not make all of the ingredients that went into that pot of soup, Joseph Smith was the head chef responsible of going around to every member in the kitchen to make sure that when he got that school of prophets running and going, that uh, it produced something of truth. 
So, um, yes. So, prepared by the Prophet Joseph Smith, I think that's even better. So, um, I still would say that that, that that would make them his lectures on faith. He prepared them. So... I'm scrolling down here to find an at two. Okay, so building science says that is true. Commandments are covenants. Here's a thought. When we pray and ask for help, blessings, etc., are we not also making a covenant with God? Food for thought. Yeah, you know, but yeah, and see, my and maybe this is a, a, a maybe this is a little bit just me, but whenever I pray and ask for something, I always ask what I need to do to get it. Right? I always I always say, okay, Lord, I'm asking for something. I know that there is a principle upon which this is based that I can qualify for. You know, I can qualify for this. Wilt thou tell me what that is so that I can I can qualify for this? If if there is nothing and this this is just something I need to pass through, you know, thy will be done and not my own, right? I'm following I'm tr I'm going to try to my best to follow the example of your your son. But, you know, whenever I'm asking for something, whenever I want a blessing, I know I know that it is based on a covenant with God. I know it is based on a, a an obedience to a principle upon which God ha and the heavens are predicated. And so if, if I could just know that, if you could just share that with me, tell me what I need to do because I know once I do, I will qualify for that blessing. And I know you're a good father. I know you love me, and I know that the only reason why you're not giving me things is because I'm doing something to screw it up, right? I know, I know, or that I need to learn something. So, Father, it, you know, it's that that age-old card, right? Give me the wisdom, or give me the strength to to you know, or give me the wisdom to accept the things that I cannot change and know the difference. I don't know. It's that Walmart card. People are people know the Walmart card stuff much better than me, but uh, give me the. Uh, the courage to accept the things I cannot change. Give me the, you know, the wisdom to tell the difference. That Walmart card. That's the kind of concept that, that we, that the communication that we need to have with God, I believe. And uh, because it's based off of a, a true understanding of the principle of faith. So, and, and, and yes, every commitment, every covenant, every obedience that we have there, God, uh, God will give good things to those uh, who, who qualify for it and ask. So, um, uh, Danielle says here, a uh, husband preach my gospel distinguishes commandments, commandments and covenants as different things, right? I guess when it comes down to it, one is implied and one explicitly states the blessings. I'm going to have to read that and preach my gospel. I don't know what, what section are you referring to there that distinguishes between the, the commandments and the covenants. Uh, it's very interesting because there is a section called commandments uh, in Preach My Gospel, it's chapter uh, four. I'm not familiar with what you're referring to there, uh, Brother Sullivan. I would be, if you have that reference, I would love to read that, that, that there's a distinguishing between uh, covenants and uh, commandments. Commandments are what God tells us to do. Yes, covenant is when uh, uh, we promise to do the commandment, right? Yeah, they, they are definitely connected, right? So... Uh oh, let's just skip down to the bottom here. Okay, um, I would love that though. I love preach my gospel. I'm not familiar with what section you're referring to there. I'd love to read that. Um, Antonio, Antonia, she says yes, yes, yes. We do them because we have faith that he has a reason and not because there is a direct blessing. Yes, but once again, I think this might be a, a, a semantics thing, right? Like, um, may, like we might be talking a little past each other. Like when I was talking about, uh, when, for example, when I, when I said that, uh, the, the, a big problem that, that that's going to happen is that we're going to be un, unwilling or unable to accept the whole staff of bread or the whole stay of water. And Blake from defending Zion correctly stated that it's actually pride. That's the issue. And so once again, like it might be like, or doctor, another example is doctor comes one twenty one, right? And why, why are they not chosen? Because their hearts are set too much upon the things of the world. I'll stop right there. And a lot of people will get upset and say, you need to continue because it says that they don't learn this one lesson and then teach the one lesson, right? Some of these things are very closely connected to each other. And it, it, it's, it's just a matter of semantics. So maybe we're, 
we're, we once again, and when this typically happens is because we're having a, a, I have a word in my head that I'm defining a certain way and, and others have a word in their head and they're defining it another way, right? Pride is an unwillingness to accept uh, the Lord's way over our own, which would include the, the whole staff of bread and the whole stay of water, right? And so um, when we do something because we have faith that the Lord has a reason, not a direct blessing, but like, isn't there always a direct blessing? Eat, aren't I learning something? Like maybe I'm learning a valuable lesson. Maybe I'm learning to be more humble. Maybe I'm like, it isn't like, I guess we'd have to define what blessing is because it, because some people see, and some people might um, define uh, uh, thorns and thistles and and trials and tribulations as as one thing, and I might define them as a blessing. Right, the the Lord is blessing us with something or giving us something because He wants to humble us. It, it's for our own good. And so some people might be a, a, a good real life application of that was the the people in the Jewish consecrate consecration camp consecration camp, whoa my goodness where they had all those fleas in their their camp, and one of the girls um, one of the individuals there prayed and thanked God for the fleas, and everyone thought it was absolutely crazy, and what they found out after the war was that because because there was so many fleas in this bunkhouse. The guards never wanted to go in there, and because the guards never wanted to go in there, they could they hid their their religious books, and they were able to read them. And so, um, uh, you might you might have thought all those fleas were a curse, but they actually were a direct blessing. And so, it's one of those things that maybe we're just having a different understanding of what the word blessing means. I I believe that when we have faith and do what the Lord tells us to do, there is always a direct blessing. It is always for our good. We just might not understand what it is. We just might not see the the ends, you know, uh, we might not see the end. We might not see the forest or the trees. We might not, we might not, and we probably won't, have the wisdom to see why this is happening in this way. So maybe uh, there's a little bit of talking past each other. I'm, um, Antonio, but I completely agree with what you're saying there, except for there is no direct blessing. So I guess what I'm asking is, uh, can you define direct blessing? Like, like what do you, when you're saying direct blessing, what are you referring to? So maybe I need to understand a little bit clearer what you're saying there. Maybe that'll help me. Hopefully that makes sense, Antonio. Hopefully I'm not, not making sense there. So Miller says, so we can be fairly confident we are in the desolating sickness part of the last day is what comes next and how it might be aware of moving to the next macro phase. Okay, Miller, um, what um, I have done and Ashley have done, we haven't actually produced any videos uh, recently other than the, the fireside and I've done something with the missionaries because we have been working very, very hard on compiling um, all of our papers into a single book that we've called, we're now calling the macro last day timeline book. And if you go to our family website and click on and get over to where the papers are, click on the section that says last days, click on the section that says macro last day timeline, you'll go to the page and at the top of the page, you're going to see a new document there that says work in progress in the macro last day timeline book. And currently we're on page like 67 on this book. And what we're doing is we're compiling all of the papers that we're doing We feel, and we're throwing it out there to people on our Discord channel and to help us to uh, to, to make it more clear and, and such. We've added, like in, in the first 20 pages, we've added like, I think it was like 50 references because people wanted references for everything. So, I mean, that took forever. We wanted really good references for everything um, uh, that even for things I thought were pretty self-explanatory, like... Um, Peter denying Jesus. We didn't put the reference to that. Now there's a reference to, to Peter denying Jesus. Um, and so if you go to the, the family website or if you click on the macro last day timeline videos, any one of them, part one through four, click on the link provided in that description. It'll take you directly to where you need to be over on the website. Um, that is what we're, we've been do, working on heavily there. So we've been working very heavily on the, the macro last day timeline book, trying to make it as, as as professional looking as possible so that people can share it. 
people can know the references and can learn the, the macro last day timeline, you know, entirely on their own. And so, yes, I am fairly confident. I was fairly confident that we're in the Destiny Sickness before, but after this last conference with uh, President Nelson referencing in his talk and saying, you know, we're living in these days, basically, um, you, you can get that in my, uh, my not only, I, re we recently did the breakdown of that talk by President Nelson, but we also did a, a paper entitled, Where Are We? And uh, I, I believe that he had clearly, he didn't need to, he went out of his way to include the, the scripture before that, that referenced the desolating sickness. And so, yeah, I definitely believe that, that we were there, but now I definitely have a, a reference from a prophet pointing to it and saying that, you know, th this is where we are. So what comes next and how am I be aware of us moving to the next macro phase? What the, what's happening next is that the power of God will descend upon the saints of the world as they were in the scattered state. That's, First Nephi 14, 14, which President Nelson said we would live to see a few years ago. I believe that that is now the phase that we're entering into now. We're still in a scat scattered, skate, sta scattered state, but the power of the, the, the Lamb is being uh, uh, brought down uh, and uh, falling upon the saints worldwide. Now, how does, that, how does that happen? It happens with a correct understanding of faith and a correct understanding of having faith as a brother of Jared, which is brought to pass by people's worthiness and faith and righteousness. And so that's an individual level. So make your home a temple. So right now we are in that time period. We're in the time period directly before the redemption and building of uh, the, I'm getting too far ahead. We're directly before the time period of the redemption of Zion. Uh, that That's definitely where, that is definitely the time period that we're in right now. And so the next things that we need to be looking for now is we need to be perfecting ourselves and making sure that, sure that uh, our, our homes are becoming a, a sacred place of worthiness and uh, righteousness, and uh, and that uh, we have that. So, what about land on? Yeah. So that's the next stage, and what happens next is Joseph's boys, and uh, the redemption. Oh, and the redemption of Zion. But the other thing that we're going to start to see before, at that same time period, is we're going to start to see the uh, the leaders of the church be called into the courts of Washington. So you might start to see some uh, legal battles uh, start to be fought over the land of Missouri. You might start to see some legal battles fight over some things. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the, the next things on the, the macro last day timeline. So if you want to head on over there and, and click on that macro last day timeline uh, paper, we've, we're, we're in the process of continually updating those visuals to make them as, as clean as possible so that it's uh, easy to see what's going on there and, and making them better. So, um, And if, you, if anybody has any questions or concerns with something that's in there, um, I, and by the way, uh, I will not... <laughs> I, in my firesides, will be calling him Joseph Smith's Lectures on Faith, but when I'm writing the Macro Last Day Timeline book, I'm, we are trying to get rid of, uh, if, if there's something like that that people find controversial, I'm just not going to include that in the book, okay? So if there's something in the book that you think, like, this needs to have a reference or the reference needs to be better or something, hey, don't hesitate to, don't hesitate to send us an email or send us something and, and, and ask and say, circle something and say, hey, this needs to be a little more clear. There's been some people, um, including Roquin, who I'm staring at. I didn't think he no came in here. Is this the same Roquin? I'm actually, I'm staring at Roquin right now as I'm saying it. Um, but he, his uh, name in Discord is Roquin. This might be the same guy um, who has done a fantastic job of giving us critique and feedback on those papers. And so thank you to everyone who's who's done that. It, it, it's helped make the papers more, much more professional and uh, easier to understand for people. So uh, I, I, we hope that it will give people a sense of peace and understanding of what's happening and why it's happening, but also the references um, to, to why we know this. And once again, the references, the reason why we're arriving at these conclusions is because of the pyramid of truth, right? Because we're starting from the, the you know, the pyramid of truth and working down. And, and that's how we're arriving at these, at these timelines. So what you are describing is what happened to the brother of Jared when he asked the Lord three questions. I don't, maybe that was something in the past that I was saying. Maybe that was something in the past that I was saying. Okay. Um, so, oh, um, let me see here. Almost done here with the questions. Um, okay, here's one. Uh, define blessing. 
good definition. So what would I define as a blessing? Are you asking me? Or were you, because that's what I asked, um, uh, I asked Antonia, did she answer it above? Because that we, you, we'd have to have an understanding of what, uh, we'd have to define uh, what blessing is in order to, to get that, right? To, for me, blessing, blessing, if I'm not being selfish, right? If I'm not being selfish, blessing is anything that comes from God that is designed to to make my life better and ultimately bring me back into the presence of the Father. Everything else is a distraction. Everything else is a, is a distraction. If it doesn't bless my life and bring me back into the presence of my Father, it's a distraction. And blessings that come from God all are designed to make us happy, to give us joy, and bring us back into the presence of the Father. They're, they're, they're dualistic in that regard, right? Because they, they, they give us joy, but it's an eternal joy to help us to understand what it's like to live like God lives and to understand how happy it is to live like God lives will give us faith, power, motivation to be more like God. And that is a cycle that feeds unto itself so that we can um, get better and progress and, uh, and apply more of the atonement in our life day to day and bring ourselves through the help of the Savior uh, and grace back into the presence of the Father. That's how I would define a blessing. And obedience to any principle, any commandment that the Lord is, gives us, according to my that definition, is a blessing. Okay. And that might mean a thorn and a thistle occasionally. So that's my definition. So I'd have to understand other people's uh, definitions. So um, Brett says here, yo, yeah, she isn't too cruel to him. It is sinking in with him. Oh, maybe he's not talking to me. I thought that I saw a little at the front. I don't think that's me. Um, Corey 10 boom, sister flees in the bunkhouse. So that's the story. That's the story that I was uh, referring to. Thanks for sharing that, James. So it's Corey 10 booms, the sister with the fleas in the bunkhouse. Um, a fantastic story to, to define, uh, what a blessing might be. Um, promised land says, why would we keep any commandments unless there was a blessing for keeping them? Because God told us to. We aren't that obedient. I, that that that's my understanding. My understanding is um. Uh, my understanding is is that um. Everything the Lord tells us to do has a reason, and that reason is to bring us back into His presence. And uh, when we understand that, and we keep the we we keep the commandments to get those blessings, to to take steps back into the Father's presence, because we're outside. And we want to get back. And so we we do what he tells us to do because we want that. And if if we don't understand that, then then yeah, uh, we, we won't we won't act. And so that's why faith then becomes a motivating and a powerful influence. Uh, and without it, there just isn't any motivation. There isn't any action. So yeah, I would agree with that promised land. That's been my um my definition of understanding. I would love to see Antonia's definition. So Oh, so she says here, yes, I agree on the commandments. So I, okay, I think that means it. I don't know. Um, I need a consecrate consecration camp. Yeah, whatever. It's a consecration. Whatever, whatever. Shoot me in, shoot me in the face. Shoot me in the face. I'm talking talking fast. I can't I can't handle myself, and I uh, I uh, can barely barely speak English. I can barely speak English. Can't believe any of you understand anything I'm saying. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I probably would speak another language better than English. I'm so bad at English. So, yeah, King Benjamin explains, uh, Reba says here that, that, uh, every time we're obedient, we are blessed. So God has paid us. Thus, we are always in his debt. That's a fantastic set of scriptures. So King Benjamin says that, that as soon as we're obedient, God doth immediately bless us. Doth immediately bless us. We might not understand what it is, but he doth immediately bless us. So that we 
are always in his debt. So we are always unprofitable servants. We are always um, given more than we deserve. Yes, that's a beautiful set of scriptures that explains what what hopefully I, I tried to explain uh, earlier, but that was a, that's a, another really good example of, of my definition of blessing and uh, and how when we're obedient, there's that immediate tie um, tie in. So Claudia then says, commandments are listed among the things that the Lord will crown. Commandments are listed among the things the Lord that the Lord will crown the righteous with, crowned with blessings from above and with commandments, not a few. Yeah, and so in that context, wouldn't com- yeah wouldn't commandments then wouldn't we then view them in a much better light? Commandments are covenants. Commandments are cause and effect. So, what by blessing us with commandments, what he's doing is he's blessing us with the knowledge of a causal and effect, uh, a cause and effect that will enable us to to bless ourselves. So. Um, yeah, I, I, that's a beautiful scripture. Dr. Governor 59, 4 there from Claudia. It's a, a beautiful scripture. So very good. Um, what will life look like for those asked to tarry? See, and this is another one that uh, I, I love. But this is another one that people need to understand here. Okay. Um, what will life look like for those asked to tarry? Now people need to say people need to understand that like that that the they're asked to tarry. They're not told to tarry. They're asked to tarry. A, right? And B, they're asked to tarry. If you're unrighteous, you won't be asked to tarry. You won't be invited. Okay? So a lot of people will use this scripture, there will be those asked to tarry, and then they'll say, so the grand majority of the church will still be scattered worldwide. That is not how I read this at all, and that's not how I read any of 3rd Nephi chapters 20 through 25. I don't read that at all, okay? the the I read it that the majority of the church, the, the majority of the church will eventually be gathered in unto whatever is defined as the new Jerusalem, and there will be those asked to, to tarry for whatever reason brother jones you still you qualify for the new jerusalem you do you and because you qualify for it the lord cannot deny you the blessing of being there but the lord knows that if you stay behind you can save these people and you can add these people as sheaves on the floor and you can how great will be your joy with them in the kingdom of our Father in heaven, if you were the one that had, that was the instrument in the, in the hands of the Lord to do this. So, Brother Jones, will you tarry and be this instrument in the Lord's hands? That is totally different than, like, entire stakes just said, hey, you're going to stay. The scripture says you will be asked to tarry. Now, when the Lord asks us to do something, I don't believe, my, my faith doesn't allow me to believe that the Lord will ask us to do anything without giving us, especially at that point in time, uh, maybe not the reason for it, like the, the long-term reasons, but at least the short-term reasons. Why will you stay? Yea, Lord, I will. Why? Why, Lord? Because I need you here for these reasons. Well, then, Lord, I'll do it. I'll do it. If, if you need me here, I will do it. A lot of people view this as like, they're, you know, like, I view this like a calling, right? Who gets asked to be a primary teacher and doesn't know why they're being asked, right? Like, well, I don't know why I was called this. Well, probably because you're supposed to teach the primary. Like, you know, th- that's why you're being asked, right? That's how a calling works. You can deny a calling, right? You will be asked to tarry. There will be some people asked to tarry. And I believe the, the the reasons for you being asked to tarry will be just like being asked to serve as a branch president or a, or a, a primary teacher or, you know, a, a greeter, right? And so um, you'll know, you'll know why you've been asked to tarry. It'll be specific. And, and I also believe because of agency, you will have the right to deny that. You'll be able to say, nope, I don't want to tarry. Let me go into the new Jerusalem, right? But here's the thing. 
The kind of people that will qualify for the New Jerusalem are the kind of people that I believe if the Lord asked them, hey, I need you. I need you. You're the one I need to do this. Will you stay behind and do X, Y, and Z task? I believe they're the kind of people that would say, yay, Lord, in a heartbeat. I will do it. And so, um, but it won't be like they won't know. They're going to know. They're going to know. I, I really do believe that, that th there'll be specific tasks, certain reasons. So, um, And she says, we're so, you're so smart. We have to find something. I, <laughs> oh man. Well, thank you, Angie. I speaking English. I don't sound smart most of the time. <laughs> uh, I definitely don't. I, where's, where's Gabe? Oh, there's Gabe. I was like, where's Gabe to or Gabe there yeah, right below. Gabe needs to get me to try to say something in Spanish. And then everyone, everyone will realize that, uh, uh, the, okay, so Promised Land said, the flea story is in the book, The Hiding Place. I know how you like good references. That's, so anyway, so anybody who wants to know that story that I, I shared about the, the fleas, um, The Promised Land here says, uh, gives a reference. That's in the book called The Hiding Place. It's a, it's a tear-jerking story that I believe is a good example of, uh, a good example of teaching that, that blessings aren't always what we think they are. Okay. So uh, I, I I love that story. Uh, Fire and Ice says, "What you mean? You are human." <laughs> uh, I hope I'm human. Okay, so <laughs> Gabe says, "Since you are struggling with English, let's have you try some." Oh, he does it. <laughs> oh, you're terrible. You're terrible, Gabe. You're terrible. You're killing me. Uh. Okay, so Fire and Ice says, I will be made to tarry as my health is crapola. Fire and Ice, I, I have this weird, I don't know, call it an inclination that if uh, people if people are worthy for the New Jerusalem, um, and you know there are people in this group that might even be able to testify to this personally, that, that um, if you've qualified for everything, if you've qualified for everything, um, that, that there might come a point in time where angels... Um, come into your home, and by angels, I mean resurrected beings, I mean um, uh, Joseph Smith, I mean Brigham Young, I mean, there might become a point in time where these people walk into your home and they ask you, just like Jesus did to the man at, at the pools of Beth Bethesda, wilt thou be healed? And um, we'll heal you. And then say, go. Go to New, go to New Jerusalem. And so, um, you know, that man lay at the side of that pool for many, many years, many, many years. And so we need to be ready just like, um, just like President Eyring said in the last conference, live so that if the call came, we could live, leave. And so, um, that's it. So live like that so that when a, when the opportunity comes, that it may, that, that it could come that you're ready to stand up and say, yay, Lord, heal me and uh, and move forward. Just make sure that you're worthy enough and qualify for it. And I know that miracles like that are going to happen. I know it. And there are people in this group that could testify of, of miracles like that 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 they that, that I believe that they know are going to happen to them in, in, in their life. So um, Green Tree says here, uh, you might be asked to tarry because of your missionary gift. <laughs> if I'm asked to tarry, if I'm asked to do anything, you know, in in uh, I've been in Kenora for a while. And we've maybe been almost moving for three years, and I've only held uh, I, in the last three years. I've only held one calling. I've worked with the missionaries a lot, but I've only held one calling, and uh, it's been the uh, teaching the the, the the temporal preparedness or what was it, temporal uh, reliance, self reliance course with with my wife, and so I I if the Lord put me into good use anywhere, missionary work anywhere. Uh, I would, uh, I will go where you want me to go, dear Lord. So I, 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 I do not care. Um, also bear former, some of the new age people talk about is actually the same principle, the flea story to long YouTube, Google. Okay. Yeah, there's an, okay. I'd like to check that out. 
I'd like to check that out. Okay, I actually, I apologize. I'm Because now I scroll down to look at the time and I saw that Skype was blinking. And Blake says, do you need somebody to join? I don't know how long ago this was, Blake. It says eight. Okay, it was only like a half an hour ago. The fireside ended. The fireside ended a while ago. I'm in Q and A. If you wanted to join for for some to to say some words or uh, to do something, you're more than welcome to. If you're still there. Much love to you, Gabe. I love you, man. Fire and Ice, you have just as much of a shot to get there as I do. Of that, I can testify and promise you in the name of Jesus Christ. If you live worthy in, in, in death or in resurrection or in life, you will have just as much of a chance as me to get there as anybody else. I don't care what, I don't care if you're missing a leg, right? You have just as much chance to be there. And you know, um, just like, just like it, unlike the early saints who said, if I get there and just so long as I'm buried, so be it in our time period, we'd say, Oh, get me there and bury me there. I'll be there. I'll be buried for a week. You know, like the, the resurrection is coming. Right. And so, uh, it, it is so much more reassuring because it's like, if you have that faith, you know, Hey, Get me there. I know once we redeem Zion and build New Jerusalem, the Savior comes, the resurrections will start to flow. And if I'm worthy enough to get there and even die on the way there and get buried there, I'm going to be resurrected in that city. I know that that's going to happen. And so you're just as, uh, uh, you're just as likely as me. So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah, it's definitely more than, uh, it's definitely more than the, uh, um, lad, it's definitely more than a dumb and dumber. There's definitely, it's definitely more than one in one million chance. Well, maybe I am. Maybe that's right, lad. Maybe, maybe I'm saying I have a one in one millionth chance of making it there. Good point. Good point. Maybe that's what he's saying. Cause that's the, that's from dumb and dumber where he says, do I have any chances? And she's like one in a million. He's like, so you're saying I have a chance. So maybe, maybe he's saying that I'm saying I have a one in one million chance. That's good. That's good. Okay, so this uh, um, one, two, three. Sean Boy says, looking for the reference for the thousands of of uh, uh, awards that were closed that you mentioned in March. I still have not been able to find ever reference to that. Did he not get what? Oh, so he said it before. Oh, I spent twenty minutes talking to him. Okay, is to. Sh oh, okay. So we had a call work. Yeah, sorry. I I tried to answer you, Sean. Um. I tried to answer you there. Can I give some scriptural references for translation? I have an entire paper on transfiguration, translation, and re resurrection, and I have those in a in that paper, and all the references are in there. Um, uh, transfiguration is a process of being quickened by the Spirit, but it's only temporary. Translation is a process of being quickened by the Spirit, but it is semi-permanent but it is not permanent. Translated beings still need to go through a process similar to death. Resurrected beings are people who have died and then been resurrected. So there, there's the difference between those. And, and uh, a lot of people have a, a, a lot of false assumptions about uh, who will be need to be translated and how and why and when. Um, a, lot of, a lot of different things there, so... Um, that uh, a lot of good references there to, to, to get to a, a, a real understanding of, of the difference between the three and, uh, you know, why they're done and uh, what we can expect in our future. So uh, Doug says here, right leg amputee, buddy. I'm stocking up on prosthetics. Amen, brother. And, uh, you know, Doug, I believe in the New Jerusalem. I believe... Uh, in the uh, the power of the priesthood, I believe in miracles. And I know that there are going to be things that are just going to be beyond our wildest belief happening. And um, I, I just read the very first, we just got our lecture, our uh, journal of discourse, and I just read the very first one. And Brigham Young, in the very first one, was talking about Zion and was talking about how 
a lot of members have this false belief that it's if I can just get to New Jerusalem, everything will be better. But if you bring yourself to New Jerusalem and you don't have Zion in your heart, you're you're basically just going to screw up Zion when you get there. Like that that was basically the, the talk. And I thought, geez, that's a great talk to, to to put at the very beginning of the Journal of Discourses, number one. But if we perfect ourselves and we get Zion in our heart and we get, and by Zion, I mean um, the perfection, the, the faith, the righteousness, the um, the power of God in our own lives, then we can bring that with us and we can create the new Jerusalem. That we have that hope of that city, that hope of that heavenly community. Uh, we can definitely, we can definitely have and see these miracles. And uh, you're, you know, we're, we're thinking, uh, we're thinking, okay, if we can just get there. Man, I'm thinking if you get there, you're going to grow back a new leg. Like that's that's my thought process. My thought process is, is people don't people can't even of yet comprehend the miracles that are going to be taking place in that that city. That's my belief. Karen says, "What about the part member families will be be split up?" If they don't want to go to New Jerusalem, and uh, I would, unfortunately, Karen, that's a really tough question, but to answer you honestly, I would say yes. I would believe that yes, that is the time period of the separation. And President uh, Nelson said that those who you thought were your friends will betray you. And, uh, you know, I can't, like, w what do you think that that is? Like, you, you, I, to me, that's your, your family. To me, that's your close associates. To me, that's your friends and family. Those who you thought your friends will betray you. And there will come a point in time when those who will obey the Lord will be separated from those who do not. That's what President Nelson said. Now, would that include part member families? I, I'm left to conclude yes. Unfortunately, as sad as that sounds, the answer to that is yes. That there will come a point in time where families and it will get separated as those that are willing to obey the Lord are separated from those who will not. And so that that's a sad one, but it, and it's a tough one to answer. But uh, I'll I, I'll just try to answer it as honestly as possible. So so I'm scrolling down here. Where does it talk about the Assyrian? Assy the Assyrian is talked about in Isaiah. And so the Assyrian is talked about in the Book of Mormon when um, Nephi painstakingly uh, transcribes uh, four, you know, 13, 14 plus chapters of Isaiah directly from the brass plates onto his small plates. So uh, the uh, Nephi who saw, saw our day wanted us to have Isaiah where Isaiah was specifically talking about the Assyrian. So you're, you're, if you go to my Understanding Isaiah papers, you're going to, to, to see where uh, Understanding Isaiah chapters 1 through 14 correlates and, and you know is the, the same as Nephi obviously pounding in the same chapters in the Book of Mormon. So, so it talks about the Assyrian, that is Isaiah, but, uh, but Nephi also transcribes the same chapters dealing with the Assyrian in the Book of Mormon. Uh, the, uh, Polly says, not sure if my question went through question mark. Um, I'm staring at your, your thing here. The at, it says three, no, it says at two LDS archives, but I don't think there's a space. So it's not showing up as orange. So you, it might've gone through above, but I didn't see it. I, I did. It's not orange here either. So I might've skipped it uh, as well, but I'm looking at it right now, Polly. And it says, not sure if my question went through. If your bishop and stake president are still wearing masks, would you still wear yours? Most members of my ward have taken theirs off. I would follow the church policy, whatever that happens to be. So if the stake president says, you need to wear your mask, I would wear my mask. If the the, the policy is, which it seems to be, be becoming in, um, in, in the church, is that if you've been vaccinated, you no longer are required to wear a mask. Well, then if you've been vaccinated, then don't wear a mask. If the church policy is that you need to wear a mask if you haven't been vaccinated... I would then wear a mask. I, 
I stand with the church policies just like I do with the temple recommend questions. Those change, guys. In fact, uh, t uh, President Nelson changed the temple recommend questions. He, he updated them, right? Those change. Those are policy. They're not doctrine. They're policy. The, the, they change. Doctrine doesn't ever change. Policy changes. The questions that are required to get into the temple recommend, they change, right? And so I, I, we, I stand with the keys. I stand with the church and their policies. So I will do what the church says with their policies because the policies are what enable me to get into the temple and access the, the ordinances, right? And if the church policy says you have to wear a mask if you're not vaccinated and I go into the church and I'm not vaccinated and I don't wear a mask, that act of doing that disqualifies me for the 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 temple recommend because a temple recommend question is, am I honest with my dealings with my fellow men? Well, bam, I've just disqualified myself for the temple. Thus, I've cut myself off from ordinances because I failed to live policy. And so uh, my standpoint is, humble micah needs to humble himself and micah needs to follow church policy because church policy is what get, gets me to the ordinances uh, of salvation which will save my soul they are called saving ordinances uh for a reason so that's um that's my thought process on that um james says i would like visions of glory um, I started reading Visions of Glory and I had some really big problems with it. And so, um, I, like some really big problems with it. Um, there, there were things that were said in the first couple chapters that if, if you understand the keys of the kingdom and how revelation flows in the keys of the kingdom, um, there were some things in there that, um, that were that were impo you can't square it with a testimony of 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 the church so i'll i'll give you an example in the first couple chapters of the book he 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 has a near death experience where his spirit leaves his body and then he is told that the nurse in the room is having an affair with the doctor in the room and then he eventually goes back into his body and still remembers that he was told that information. I will tell you quantifiably, uh, without a doubt, that 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 he, the individual is either lying about that or he was given that information via devils and demons because they also know that information. God will not give you inspiration and revelation regarding something like that over those th for whom you do not have keys. So unless this person with this near-death experience happened to have been a stake president and these two individuals were members in his stake, then that, that, that is a huge red flag for somebody who is being led by demons and devils. And now what you have to understand with demons and devils is that we learn in the New Testament, yeah, I get it. You believe that Jesus is the Christ, but the demons and devils also know that and say that. Like when Jesus was going around, there were multiple times where a demon said, ah, oh, you're the Christ. And Jesus said, you will stop talking right now. So the the, the demons and devils will, will, will say things that are true all the time. It's what they mingle in, that 1% that they mingle in that, that, that makes it so deadly, right? And so if 99% of that book was true, but 1% of it was, was false. That 1% that they're getting you to buy into is more damning and more dangerous than you believe. If nothing else, maybe if nothing else, it gets the individual to believe that they can receive revelation for other people like that, right? They, they go, well, if this individual was told by the spirit or an angel that these two people were committing adultery without any keys, Maybe the spirit will tell me the same thing. Maybe, and that alone is, is a horrendously damning thing to, to, to convince yourself of. Without the keys, you will only receive revelation over yourself. You will not receive revelation over somebody else without the keys. Okay, that, that, is, a, that is a fact. And so I, 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 didn't, I made it about 
two or three chapters into the book and then I just had to stop because uh, that was so um that was so bad so um members um members need to under, understand have a grasp of the keys of the kingdom um and how revelation flows and if they did they they, they would read that book I know in a lot a, a, a much different manner um this individual asks, so I have a list of the top five most important papers that I put together. Um, I have a playlist on YouTube of the top 10 that if I could recommend people watch 10 videos or papers before they get into anything else, watch or read these 10 papers. I have that as a playlist on YouTube. I'm in the process of, like I've said earlier, compiling all of our work, dealing with macro last day timelines into a single read so that'll hopefully make that uh, make that easier. So, um, so yes, I do have a list of that of, of top ten. So hopefully that uh, answered that question. Uh, here's another one, Antonio. Moving your mountains may require a miracle. Learn about miracles. Miracles come according to the faith of our central that is trusting in the timeline. How and when He will bless you with the miraculous help and desire. Only your unbelief will keep God from blessing you the miracles in your life president nelson yeah my uh yeah perfect that was actually um ashley just read that uh, today in her talk that she gave on faith so yeah that's a fantastic uh um understanding of, of that that's what i that's my my understanding and my testimony as well i completely agree with that george says will there be members who tarry until the ushering in the millennium i believe that that you will be asked to tarry or asked to do something just like a calling until the calling is fulfilled Whatever that happens to be, um, eventually uh, the saints will inhabit the desolate cities, and the New Jerusalem will expand and expand and expand like a stone cut out of the mountain until it eventually fills the whole world. And so, eventually, it's just it's going to expand and expand and expand until it fills the whole world um, at the great and dreadful day. And so, um, the ushering in the millennium is uh, um, uh, is uh, a very interesting topic because you know there's prophets who have said when you bound satan in your home the millennium for that family begins at that time when we bound um satan as a people as a church the millennium will begin for us at that time in new jerusalem right when after the the jews are uh, passed through their scourging and jesus appears in the mount of olives and they rebuild that city the millennium will begin for them uh, as well and then th the same thing for the world so um, the, the, the quote unquote millennium it, is, it's a concept that we should more, more readily view as the savior living among us. And, uh, that way we, we don't get it confused with the thousand year period that we call the millennium because we don't know when that officially begins, right? We just don't know. And we don't even know what that means, that quote unquote, a thousand years. We just don't, um, uh, and so I've talked about that in a number of uh, locations. So I, we don't know, um, we don't know what that means, quote unquote, a thousand years. We just don't know because we know that the, the earth will be partially rolled back into the presence of God. We don't, time constantly changes the concept of time. And so uh, we don't know what that means. We know that one day to the Lord is a thousand years down here. So, you know, um, if we get moved back into the Lord's timetable, um, that thousand year period before the earth is judged and, and, and completely changed might be a day. It might, you know, so we, we just don't, we don't understand how that, uh, that process is going to work. We'll have a much better idea of how that process is going to work after the sealed portion of the plates is translated. And after, um, the 10 tribe scriptures come in and after we have all that truth get rolled forward in the new Jerusalem. Um, uh, he says he never had claimed that he had responsibility to make it known. It doesn't matter if he had responsibility to make it known. He doesn't have, he didn't have the right to ever learn it. He did because he didn't have the keys the the Lord would never, the Lord, that's the key. The Lord would never give him that information for my house is a house of order, saith the Lord. So it doesn't matter if he had the responsibility to make it known or not. 
the Lord, because unless that individual had keys over them, the Lord would never have revealed that information to him, either personally or through the Holy Ghost. He, the Lord, would not have. And if the Lord didn't give him that knowledge, then it had to come from, if it was true, it had to come from other, uh, another source. And the only other source of knowledge is the devil and the demons. And, and so either the individual lied about the experience or it, it's true, he did get that information, but he could not have gotten that information from the Lord or from an angel of the Lord. Could not. Because uh, he did not have keys over it. Uh, keys over that individual. So... Uh, That's you, McLean. You're utter, you're. I hate to say this so bluntly, but you're utterly wrong on this. You say here we can receive revelation about anything we want to, but not the right to preach that revelation. That's utterly wrong. If I prayed and I asked the Lord James, Lord, tell me if James is worthy for a temple recommend. Lord, tell me if James has ever cheated on taxes. Lord. Tell me if James has ever done X, Y, and Z. I have no keys over you. I have none. The Lord will never give me that answer. There is no reason for the Lord to tell me that information. There's none. No reason for the Lord to, 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 to give me that information, and so he won't. His house is a house of order, saith the Lord. But And there are a lot of cases where people will receive revelation over things that they have no keys for, and they 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 don't acknowledge that 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 revelation is from a false spirit. It's it's not from the Lord. The Lord reveals His way through the keys, through the appropriate channels, and uh, uh, what somebody does is not the business of anybody but the keys. It's not my business, right? Uh, Lord, please tell me what my next door neighbor's doing on Saturday night. Nope. The Lord will not give me that information. Nope, 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 nope. But if I keep praying about it and I keep asking about it, ugh, there might be a demon show up and, and he'll say, hey, you know what? I know what's going on over there. I was over there last night. This is what happened. And here's the thing. The demon might tell you the truth. And why would he tell you the truth? Because then he'll get you addicted to his knowledge. He'll get you confused at what's real revelation and what's false. And then when you're so addicted to it and so confused and, and when you're in the most dire need, then he slips something else in there that is just completely false. And that's when he's got you. So, you know, if nothing else, that might be the biggest and most damning 1% problem in that entire book. It's confused people about how the keys work and how revelation works. We can't receive revelation for anything outside our stewardship keys. That That's just, that's, that's established doctrine that goes back all the way to Joseph Smith. Like, that one is so in stone. So... So that one, that one's a really important one. Uh, that's a really important one, James. I'd love to have a, a, a more a talk with you on that one because that's one that we really need to, to understand, really need to understand. Because, uh, and when I went over that uh, the talk by, what was her name, Sister Wendell? No. Where she had that talk on receiving the revelation? Craig. Craig, Sister Craig. So went over that talk by Sister Craig. She had, um, she had, a perfect example of how you receive revelation. The Lord told her that she shouldn't do use her, what was it, her cell phone. She shouldn't use her cell phone in the bank. That's all the Lord told her to do standing while standing in line. So then sister Craig goes to the bank and goes, Oh, I need to put my phone away. She then sees the old man and has a conversation with him. And he's like, Oh my goodness. It's so nice for you to talk to me. It was my birthday today. Okay. The, the, that's how we know it came from the Lord. The Lord would never have told Sister Craig, that guy over there, it's his birthday. Because she doesn't have the keys over that guy. But she he can and will tell her, you need to get off your phone and you need to go talk to that guy. 
once she gets off her phone, once she goes over there and talks to the guy, then it's revealed by the guy that it's her, that it's his birthday. Then we have the confirmation. That is how uh, the Lord works with that, that that revelation. So hopefully that's a, hopefully that makes sense. Um, no. So James, I don't believe God will ever tell us anything outside of our stewardship or keys, but he will tell us what to do. So I do believe that if we're encountering somebody that, that we don't know anything about, God will tell us what to do, but he won't tell me anything about the individual. He won't tell me this individual drinks. He won't tell me this individual. It was his birthday yesterday. He won't tell me this individual cheated on his spouse. He will tell me, Micah, say this. Micah, don't lose your temper. Micah, love him. Micah, do this. That's how the re revelation will come if I don't have keys over him. So, um, uh, Kevelation, well, that's an awesome name. Look at Korah, how he started believing falsehoods given to him, right? Yes, we have to know how to discern spirits. Um, Blake has a really, really solid breakdown of, uh, uh, if you, you join Discord, and go to discerning spirits, and so does uh, Roquin added a really good um, uh, quote from, I forgot who it was, on discerning spirits. It's in the pin section. We definitely need to understand how to discern spirits. We definitely do. Um, so DJ says, do we know if the 10 tribes are aware of us even though we don't know where they are? Is it assumed that all of them qualify for the New Jerusalem? Um it is not assumed that all of them qualify for the New Jerusalem. We don't know because here's the thing. It's because what do we do know? We know John the Revelator is with them, preparing them for the return, which means what? If they were all ready and all worthy, what is John preparing them for? Right? So John is there teaching them and he is doing things to get them ready. I, I To me, that is not enough to say um, definitively that 100% of them are good. Um, my paper... Uh, Satan, the great counterfeiter, goes over that a little bit, um, or a lot. Um, they def... I... What? Saying that, that's the prophet, are we already? Yeah, that's right. So, just like us. Just like us, DJ. We have a prophet. Are we already? I don't... And do, do we all qualify for the New Jerusalem? So, why would we assume it's the same for them? Uh, why wouldn't we just assume it's the same for them? I believe it is exactly the same for them. Do they know about us? Yes. Because we know about them. And uh, John the Revelator is there preparing them. Now, how do you, as John, prepare the people to leave to go to New Jerusalem without saying, we're going to need to go to New Jerusalem, right? That's kind of that's kind of central to uh, that preparing process, I believe. And so, um, yeah, I would definitely say that they definitely know th about the New Jerusalem and they're definitely prepared to go there. George says, could you uh, extrapolate my mouse is here. Oh, that is right. Extrapolate on the quote, armed with righteousness and with power in God. George, there's actually a really good talk by, um, was it Orson Pratt or Parley P. Pratt? I think it was Orson. Huh? I think Orson. Was it Orson? Orson Pratt that went over that. And uh, um, what was it? We, we went over that in the last fireside. Didn't I? What was that? What was that talk? Do you remember it? Can you look it up? No? Can you remember it was the last fireside. Okay, so George, if you go to the last fireside, I I have the, 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 a really good talk by either Orson Pratt or Parley P. Pratt, those two beautiful brothers that I always get mixed up. Um, they, um, and then there's also there's Parley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt, and then Orson Hyde, Orson Hyde. and there's also Orson Hyde. So there's the the three that uh, will always uh, mess with my mind. So um, I go I I share a talk there that he gave that's really good really good that that explains that um in in a lot more depth than i can do in two minutes uh here so definitely go check that out i can put the link later yes so uh gabe says i'm teaching primary in today's lesson the mentioning of importance of the lord using patterns so we're not deceived this is the pattern of revelation yes it is amen right gabe that's right could you, uh, James says, can I uh, cite some references for me to st study? How do I spell Roquin? I said, that's about right. I don't know. How do you spell it? Is there a U, X, or U in there? He said R-O-U, 
Q U A N. I actually saw him up above in the chat. Like I saw a Roquin up here and I went, is this the same one? If you scroll up a, up ahead, there was a Roquin. I'm doing it right now. And it might be the same guy. Like I've never seen the word Roquin before. Right here. Right here. So uh, it Roquin Thompson. Right? This is exact. I don't know if this is the same guy. I, it probably is. Uh, is it a redhead? Okay, so yeah. So, yeah then it has to be him. Roquin uh, means apparently, in, was it French? French, it means redhead. And so um, he just calls himself Roquin. So that was the name there. Uh, he, on Discord, uh, produces or shares a lot of really, really good stuff. Re I really appreciate uh, the stuff he shares. Really, uh, it's really, um, really solid. I, I really enjoy it. So, and I really appreciate him taking the time to, to edit and proofread some of these papers. So. Um, the, the, the paper I would, uh, take a, take a look at James is my keys of the kingdom paper, but I would definitely love to have a, a more conversation about this because it doesn't matter if you're in the spirit world or not. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, and it doesn't matter if he received, if, if he revealed the identity of the doctors or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that he said that he was told information about them. That's what matters. Right, that that's the that's the only thing that matters with that. So, so um, um, I don't believe. No, I do no, James. I do not believe there's any exceptions to the rule, because that that's no. I because my house is a house of order, saith the Lord. As as soon as there's exceptions like that, as soon as there's exceptions like that the entire kingdom would collapse. It would, it would, everyone could receive revelation about anyone for any reason. Um, in fact, oh, here's a, you know, there was one from, oh, where do we get that? That, the, that story from President Oaks, where President Oaks told the story about some individual that prayed and said that came up to somebody else in, in the, in the, in the congregation and, Oh my gosh. Okay, I'll find that for you. But there was a, a a perfect example of what I'm describing here that Elder Oaks gave uh that where he was talking about a story about an individual that that said that they had prayed and then the Lord told them information about this woman and uh and then went over and then told them that and then these two people went inactive and because they were so upset at this person and Oaks said Oaks said this person could never and would never be given that information because it was outside the, the purview of the keys. So, would my non-member husband need to be baptized before he could go to New Jerusalem with me? I have no idea. That's a that's a really good question, Karen. I don't I don't know. Um, I I I would say this that that the New Jerusalem becomes not is originally, but the New Jerusalem as in Jackson County is a city that is so worthy that Jesus walks the streets. Okay. Now, what does that mean? It means thus, and it says no unclean thing can enter into it. So to me, that describes to me, the Holy of Holies in the temple that just, that describes, you know, the, 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 the temple of temples, right? That's what your, your city becomes. And the, the question then would become, does my non-member daughter, sister, mother, uh, spouse, need to be baptized before they can go with me to the temple. And, and, and then if they do need to go with me, if they do need to get baptized before they can go with me to the temple, then I, I, my assumption would be that I don't know why that would be different, um, for the city, the new Jerusalem. But you also have to understand that the 10 tribes return to, um, uh, to Zion and they don't have all the covenants but they, but there is a process of them getting them, right? And so, and then there's also inside the city, outside the city, because we know that there will be pe people living within the confines of the New Jerusalem, um, uh, confines of the New Jerusalem that um, won't be members of the church, but they'll still be living there. But they won't be living in the cities, 
if that if that makes sense. So th there will be people like there will be people inside the United States of America, but they're not living in Boise, Idaho, right? That if that makes sense, they're they're still within the the protection of New Jerusalem, but they're not uh, they're not actually in the 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 city city. So in order to to be in that, we need to we need to have uh, purified ourselves because only the pure in heart will be in Zion. So um, I have another question here that says, see Jordan's question, 10 comments above. So I'm looking above Jordan. Okay, there is no at here. If the new Jerusalem were to be built within the next five to 10 years, how do you explain all the announcements of additional temples? Will other temples be constructed at the same time as new Jerusalem? Yes. The answer to that is yes. And uh, the, simply put, yes, temple construction does not stop. For, for example, to answer your question really simply there, Jordan, after after the battle of Armageddon, do, do the Jews just give up and stop? Or does it say that they rebuild the temple in Jerusalem? It says they rebuild the temple in New Jerusalem. So temple construction doesn't stop. Huh? Old Jerusalem. So, yeah. So, did I say Old New Jerusalem? So... So in old Jerusalem, in Palestine, after the, the, the battle of Armageddon and after the city is ravished and after Jesus appears on the Mount of Olives and splits it, th there's a period of seven years where it says that they will live off the spoils of the land. It says they'll live off the spoils for seven years. And it says that at that time they will rebuild the cities of the wall. They will rebuild the temple. And, uh, and so that process occurs after the Mount of Olives. So Will, will temple building construction ever cease? No. And uh, there, there are quotes to sustain the idea that temple construction will continue well into the millennium. And so, um, so no, just because we're building New Jerusalem does not mean there will not be other te temples. And while the New Jerusalem is being built, there will be gatherings worldwide to places of safety. And there have been a lot of people who have said, including Harold B. Lee, President Harold B. Lee and others, that these places of safety will be the stakes and and are could be very likely tied to temples. And so these temples that are being built worldwide in the next, you know, five to ten years or, you know, could very well be the places of safety for all these people worldwide. So um, it is absolutely crucial that we do not stop building these temples now and into the millennium. So hopefully that makes uh, answers your question. Um, yeah, so Lindy says, we know that there will be people who go to Zion who aren't members. Eventually Zion is perfected. So that, yeah, there's, there's this concept of where are they going? Right. And so some a lot of people will say that they're going to actually Jackson County, Missouri. I don't see and that, that's controversial in that. I don't know if that's guaranteed. I think that there's a very good chance that the 10 tribes go to Utah. I think they go to the everlasting hills and they tremble there that the everlasting hills tremble at their presence. I think that they get all their temple endowments. They get all of that stuff there and people are brought into the program. And so, you know, it says in in 3 Nephi 21 that if the Gentiles repent, I will establish my church among them, and then they will be numbered among this people whom I have given this land unto them for their inheritance. So we don't get given inheritances until after the New Jerusalem, right? We get prompt we, we, right now. We have promises of inheritances, but we don't actually have the inheritance. The inheritance doesn't happen until after the, the new Jerusalem. And therefore, what Jesus is saying here is that there is a time period where there are a group of people who have been given their inheritances in Jackson County, Missouri, and there is a church being established throughout the land, and people who repent will go in and be numbered among those who have already been given this land as their inheritance. So, um, this is that process of being gathered in and unto the new Jerusalem. And so, um, yes, there is a process. So when you're saying the new Jerusalem, what are you talking about? Are you talking about Jackson County or are you talking about like Utah and, and the, the surrounding areas? 
while they're being brought into the program because we know there's there going to be two areas, right? We know we know that the 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 the, 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 ugh, the dragon will be wroth when he can't get the child. That's in uh, Revelation chapter twelve that he he can't get the child. That's the New Jerusalem. So he goes after the remnant of the seed worldwide, those that still keep the the, the covenant. And so there there is a there is a a Abinadi as a type. There is going to be two different groups. And uh, and so, will non-members be in Jackson County, Missouri? My answer to that is unequivocally no. I don't believe that. Will will there be non-members in the New Jerusalem? Yes. Will there be people in the protection of the New Jerusalem and Zion as it expands? Yes. But that process changes, I believe, at the great and dreadful day. But... Uh, as 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 Joseph Smith said, that the Lord will continue to pour out pestilence, plague, and uh, and destruction upon the heathens, heathen nations, until they all come and either join join or are eventually destroyed from off the face of the earth. So, there, that once again, process. It's not a singular event; it's a process of events. <laughs> J S H F says, "Do our 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 ants?" Oh, that's my name. Do our ancestors see any of our sins on the other side of the veil? Uh, unfortunately, I probably would assume they do. <laughs> I probably. That's a very interesting topic that I'd love to get into because a lot of members don't realize that people on the other side of the veil are looking for the signs of the second coming as well. A lot of members apparently don't realize that, that, that that's happening. So, because they want to know when the second coming is happening just as much as we do because they want their bodies back. And so, um, and uh, that's all taught in the LDS student manual. Um, and so I can, I can, I'd love to do a paper on that one. Okay, so George says, remember you saying that the building of the New Jerusalem does not have a set date. It's dependent on the saints, correct? Given that, when do you think the latest date can start to be built? I believe you take the date, the, la the, lace, the last date for the Mount of Olives, right? You subtract whatever date that is from that in the, in the mind of the Lord. Uh, and then you subtract seven years from that. That's how I believe that... And, and that's where I'm getting my macro last day timeline from. Because if we've run out of time, the Lord still needs to fulfill every jot and tittle of, of every prophecy made. And so there has to be enough time in there for a seven-year famine, Joseph in Egypt as a type, either chapter 13. There needs to be enough time for all these prophecies to be fulfilled and yet still be accomplished before... Um, uh, uh, Jesus sets foot on the Mount of Olives and the great and dreadful day, which events and time periods are set in the mind of God. And so, um, I believe that, that that's how it's pretty easily, pretty easy how you then cal calculate that. So, uh, it's based off of the prophecies, how long they last and, um, and then just adding them onto the backside and saying, well, then it has to be no less than this amount of time. So. Uh, John Perry says in his October talk, go forward with faith. The president Nelson said the temple, the house of the Lord is a place of security. Unlike any other. Amen. John Perry. And you know, we have Aaron Allen in the group here who is actually involved in, a, uh, the, this temple construction and, um, uh, Oh, geez, what was it called? Modular construction, uh, really provided some really cool information uh, on that. Um, our, our ability to build temples, um, mod in a modular fashion, will uh, i don't think that we can calculate yet how exponential um the the speed of us being able to build temples now is like a modular construction is just significantly easier significantly cheaper um it, it's it's a it, amazing so so long as the world doesn't fall apart and we, we don't have the resources and the means to do this stuff anymore uh, we could see some these temples that have been dedicated or uh, announced now be built a lot quicker than people realize. And uh, Aaron Allen uh, could answer any of your questions on that. So, because he's actually pers he's personally involved. That's his uh, 
um, is career the correct word? His um, vocation? What's the word? That's a good one? Okay. My English sucks. Okay, so um, that's it. Is it a good idea to move to Jackson County now? No. It's not a good idea to move to Jackson County now. I've answered that in a number of papers. Uh, it's not a good idea to move to Jackson County now. Um, so, no. We go when the keys tell us to go. Amen, Reba. We go when the keys tell us to go. Yay. Hey, do we have the 24 temples in New Jerusalem ready to go? Yeah. You know, if it's modular t temple building, I mean, you could literally truck those in and just drop them 24 at a time. Like, that'd be crazy. Absolutely crazy. People don't understand how quickly a lot of this stuff could happen. Uh, do you have any insights that uh, young adults that you'd like to share? Uh, get your life in order. That's what I, my life, my uh, advice would be to be for um, young people, because you young people are ex, are going to be part of the the, the Lord's youth battalion. Um, I think that um, I think that whether a man or a woman, if you're a man and you're you're involved in the the redemption of Zion and and the, the Lord's youth battalion, or or you're a woman, uh, the blessings that that will be able to be poured out upon your heads in this generation regarding the new Jerusalem are things that you do not want to disqualify yourself from obtaining. Uh, you, you are, I believe based off of the signs and the time that we have the last generation that can be born. And I think it's almost even poetic to a point of irony that we call these people Gen Z. The alphabet's over guys. This is it. Um, uh, get, get your life in order and get yourself ready because you do not want to disqualify yourself from, from for these blessings. You do not want to. And the Lord called you down at this time, at this specific time, the young and middle-aged people, because he knew that when the world went crazy, went to clown town, that, there, that you, enough of us, would keep our heads screwed on straight, listen to the keys, listen to the Holy Spirit, and be obedient to the principles and ordinances of, of the gospel. So my advice would be keep yourself in the game. I, I really don't believe that you, you have to keep yourself in the game another five years. I mean, it's like one of those things where it's like, what do you have to lose? What, what do you have to lose? Nothing by doing right. You have nothing to lose and you have everything to gain, everything to gain. So just stay in the fight another five years, just stay in the fight another five years. I know we're going to start seeing some things um, that are just going to start blowing people away. And we don't want to disqualify ourselves for that. Yeah, the world is going crazy, Rima. The world is going crazy. Thank God for thank God for people like you and the internet that allows me to reach out and, 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 and feel connected to you. And, 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 <laughs> and that we can uh, trust in the Lord and trust in the keys and trust in the revelations and have faith. Brothers and sisters, I love you. Angie, I love you. Do, do not give up your birthright. Do not squander the opportunity that we have. Uh, whether or not you're a young person, whether or not you're an old person, do not squander what you have. There will be an opportunity for everyone regarding the new Jerusalem and the promises that were given to us by our fathers, okay? They're, they are promised to us, and I know they will be fulfilled. I know they'll be fulfilled. And we just need to qualify ourselves for them. Do what we need to do to qualify for them. And, and I, the Lord has never let me down. The Lord has never let me down. Maybe so that I can stand up and say things like this. I know that when you obey the commandments, I know that when you do what he tells you to do, the Lord doth immediately bless you in ways that maybe we don't comprehend, but he doth immediately bless us. And there will come a point in time, there will come a point in time where the Lord is dishing out inheritances. There will come a point in time when he's dishing out those inheritances. And he turns to those that said, ah, what does it profit us that we have served the Lord and walked mournfully before before him and kept his statutes? What is it? What has it profited us? There will come a point in time where Jesus will turn to those people and he will say, do you still feel the same way? 
do you still feel the same way? And they will weep and gnash their teeth and mourn because I know that the Lord will make things right. And he, when he dishes out his, his, the inheritances and he rewards the righteous, I know, I know that, that he will wipe away every tear and it might not seem right now, but it might not seem like the righteous are rewarded and the wicked are punished now. It might not. That's the time period we live in. It's upside down world. It's upside down world. But I know that when Christ comes, it's going to turn right side up. And you and I do not want to disqualify ourselves for that. We want to be the crowns in the the, the jewels in the crown that Lord the Lord des- describes the righteous saints being. We want to be those jewels. We want to be those jewels underneath Christ in his kingdom because I know I know that missing that opportunity will will uh, be something that uh, that even if you make it to the celestial kingdom, even if somehow you make it to the celestial kingdom, you will regret missing this opportunity for the rest of, of eternity. Do not let this opportunity slip you by. That's my that's my testimony. And I share it with you, and I love you all, and I pray that uh, you keep the faith. God bless. Godspeed. Keep the faith is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.